Hello, everybody. It looks like we are live. Welcome to the show. I'm your host, Chris, and I call this show the Weekly Spinner Rack. What do we do on this show? Uh, we talk about the latest comics that have come out. You know, uh, Miracle Man, Silver Age is wrapped up. Uh, arguably controversial, like uh, Cobra Commander bringing in some G.I. Joe lore. I've got a ton of amazing news that's happened. Uh, stuff about Ninja Turtles, Thundercats, uh, the Go Nagai Museum over in uh, Japan. Uh, uh, all sorts of stuff. I'm so excited, but I'm really excited because we're going to have a guest today, Mr. Mike Allred. Tell you what, let's uh, let's kick things off proper with a quick little intro. Folks, you've earned it. You get a double salute. Look at that. That's what you get by tuning in early. You got a double salute. Hello, everybody. I see a lot of people jumping into the chat. We're kicking it off, but I'm going to just start things off proper by introducing our guest. Uh, definitely a favorite of mine. If you've watched Comic Tropes, you should know this. Mr. Michael Allred. Mike, thank you so much for giving us some of your time today. I sincerely appreciate that. I appreciate you welcoming me <laughs> that's mostly what i do i welcome my guests i i ignore any questions and we take off so oh. we've nailed it we've got a perfect oh, what's this Did oh you got a spinner rack because <laughs> it's the weekly spinner rack it takes oh. me a moment to put these things together but i sincerely appreciate that um looking good sir and i've got a few questions about your career for for the audience and we will be talking about an upcoming convention uh, that Mike is going to in just a few days. It's called the Original Art Expo, kind of first of its kind for here in America. We'll get to that. Uh, if you'll bear with me, uh, Mike, I'd like to start with a question that also has a compliment within it. Um, I'm a big fan of uh, David Bowie. David Bowie is, uh, I I'm probably not as much of a uh, a rock and roll guy is, is some of, as you may be, but I, but Bowie was definitely a favorite of mine and, uh, his passing definitely like hurt and, and it hurt for a while for some reason, um, maybe because it was unexpected. And, uh, then you came out with that lovely, um, biography and, uh, and it really, um, helped give me a, a sense of closure. Um, not that that was its goal, but, but it, but it helped me in that way. So I, I sincerely appreciate that. And my question Related to that is when you decided to 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 work on this book, uh, you know, it's a rare example of you doing nonfiction. Um, did you did your creative process change or adjust any when you were talking about, you know, a real person and real events, re real places in history? I don't remember the process changing. In fact, it was it's probably the easiest project I've ever done. No kidding. Um, I my brain my soul is just filled with all things bowie he he's been a huge inspiration to me uh, and and his music puts images in my head which is, have inspired many of my stories and i have many characters that are inspired by him and his personas in fact the whole persona aspect of bowie's ever morphing career has been inspirational to me. So, um, yeah, tackling it, it was just, uh, it flowed. It, there was just so much that I wanted to get in there. And right. uh, yeah, it, it, uh, it, it, it flowed. I just loved it. You know, um, you, you uh, I, I think you and, and, and your whole team, uh, really did, did him justice, a uh, fascinating life, fascinating, uh, artist who, who definitely kept sort of reinventing himself and, and working to make himself relevant. Do you ever feel like that's, uh, you know, a challenge for, for you as a, as a comic book artist? You've obviously been working several decades now, you know, do, do, what challenges do you think you face to sort of continue to, to find relevancy in the work that you do or, or at least excite yourself? That's it. I have to, I have to entertain myself. It's, it is a selfish act. Mm. I have to entertain myself. 
and and then on the back end have enough hope and faith that there will be an audience to enjoy what I'm creating. And I do ha have to mention Steve Horton. Um, he's the guy that came to me and, and was like, um, would you be interested in doing a, a book on David Bowie? And I was like, if you can find a home for it, I'm all in, I'll throw everything in. And he, he did. So yeah. it, it wouldn't have kicked off without him. And then once it got going, I just, it was like riding a rocket. But that, yeah. that's kind of my whole career. I, I had a previous career uh, in broadcasting, and it was hard work with very little reward. And in my spare time, my spare time, I made comic books. And when that started to take off, uh, and Laura, with her support, becoming the breadwinner as I committed to doing comics full time. Uh, I decided to work as hard as I was forced to work previously. So to be able to work on something I love, that was the secret sauce that really kicked things off for us. That's Laura's, nice to hear. Yeah, That's Laura's faith in me and just the work ethic. And yeah. then, of course, the support that came because every step of my career there's always been a publisher or an editor or a marketing director that believed in what I was doing and put their heart and soul into it too. And um, right. that needs to happen. And people like you, you know, you, you, you need to have the support of the people that love this art form. And I never forget that. I never take that for granted. It, yeah, it, it, obviously, there's a lot of people in um, comics that that love you, uh, love collaborating with you. You've you've worked with several people um, again and again. I'd like to talk about one interesting collaboration in your history, and we're going back over 20 years now, which blows my mind. But obviously, you you mostly like you you know you write and you illustrate, and and often you'll ink your own work. And there's that one sort of blip where you were inking. Darwin Cook back in 2002. Yeah. And, um, you know, I haven't really seen you do a lot of that before or since on, on other people. I was just kind of curious how you really decided to do that. Like, you know, push yourself into to, to just that role with, with Darwin and, and uh, on that. One of the happiest convergences of the universe in my, not my career, but my life, um, Ed Brubaker, who I knew, when he was a cartoonist and okay. an underground cartoonist, uh, alternative cartoonist, writing and drawing his own work, Low Life was one of his things before he became a celebrated scripter. So I knew him from the, our first year, our probably first convention. Oh, okay. 1990. Yeah. So um, we were at a San Diego Comic Con. Ed wanted to introduce me to Darwin who wanted me to ink him. He liked my brush line. Darwin has an amazing line, but for whatever reason, he, he I guess he wanted, maybe he, maybe he wanted to take a little of the load off. Hmm. Uh, um, I never really asked why, because I was just glad that he asked. But Ed introduced yeah. us and uh, it was instant love. Darwin and I just clicked on every level. We loved the same, so movies, same movies. Um, and uh, asked if I'd be interested in, first of all, seeing his design, his new redesign of Catwoman. I was all in, and yeah. it just and it was it, it was an easy gig. His pencils are so tight. Uh, oh, okay. It, it wasn't work at all. And then right after that, he came and lived with us. <laughs> he just he just came and uh, moved in uh, with us in Eugene, Oregon, and we had I just. Didn't know uh, yeah, we bought this little cabin on the coast, on the Oregon coast. It was on a lake, and it uh, there's a, a creek that goes through the dunes, the largest expanse of dunes mm -hmm. on the coastal dunes. So you can get out there, and it you, looks like you're in the Sahara, where you see nothing but sand. But then you keep going, and if it, you either hike across the dunes or go through the creeks, yeah. like in a kayak, and nobody's there. Like it's the most private beach. It's it's crazy sparse and beautiful but anyway so 
it was awesome that he was staying with us then because we then also went out there and when we were staying at this cabin we had very little to do but draw and or you know play games and stuff and that's perfect yeah so we sat on the floor and uh passed drawings to each other and inked each other's drawings and and from that came this adam west illustration that i drew he inked and that uh became the color of cover of solo it instigated uh dc to get the likeness rights for adam west which became batman 66. wow and i did a co i did the a cover for every single issue the crossovers too yeah yeah and so all started solo was a great project i wish i wish dc would bring it back or every publisher should have their own oh. version of solo what what an anthology that was yeah. i did not realize so much uh came out of uh that meeting that's amazing oh, man. and then he, he uh uh he of course was my first fill-in artist on X Force and Ecstatics, and um, yep. he did the Wolverine Dupe uh, spinoff, and then he would do uh, Madman pieces for me, short stories. He and Jay Jay Bone, um, yeah, it was it was just uh, constant yeah. and, and so generous too. He's constantly giving me. I'm looking at original art that he just gave to me. I'm just a very generous, lovely person. I'll, and, I'll just um, say, since we're talking about him, one of my favorite memories, I, I feel so lucky. Uh, Darwin was coming to the Smithsonian in D.C. when I was living there to talk up his upcoming Parker books. And so he was just giving a, a speech at one of the Smithsonian's. It was the middle of winter, one of the worst snowstorms D.C. ever got. I mean, I just barely got there to the Smithsonian. No, very few people. And we basically got all snowed in and stuck there. Like it wasn't very easy to leave. And he and his wife just spent a couple hours in the lobby, just chatting with us all, talking comics, talking about, and, and it was just so easygoing. He was just uh, an incredible artist, but also like just, just very, very kind. I, I, um, I get a little emotional sometimes thinking about it because he was just a great guy. Yeah. And his, his wife, Marsha too, just love her to pieces. She was great. And what was fun is we would, if we were invited to a show, we would say, well, we'll go if you invite Darwin. Or he'd say, we'd go if, you, if you'll if you bring, you know, Laura and Michael. Yeah. And we would do that. And I remember spending, we were, uh, went to a Quebec show and and the four of us just had the best time. It's I just some of stories. Of memories. That was a magical, it was a very tiny show. I think it was the first one that these organizers put together. So we just had so much time to spend with, there were more guests uh, than there were, uh, uh, you know, there were more artists than there were guests. <laughs> <laughs> I've been to one or two places like that. Yeah. And, um, um, the organizers were grateful to have us there. there. It was a starting off point for them. And we just had a blast conquering Quebec. So that's so cool it, to hear. Yeah. It, it 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 takes me down a tangent of just just thinking about like um conventions i do you have any good awkward convention stories by any chance i'm putting you on the spot there have you ever had any good weird stories from like a convention whether it's with like you know fellow creator the organizers or fans do you have anything like that it's been 99 percent awesome in every way sure but we were on a tour through Europe that uh, had been organized. And one of the legs was Belgium. And there was this terrific comic shop, terrific in that their, their inventory was spectacular. And also the building itself was levels that opened into an atrium. So you could be looking at like animation cells on the second floor and original art on the third floor. And you'd look down to all the shelving down below. So just super cool. But I had injured my my drawing hand. Oh. I had I'd wrecked on my bike, and um, and so it was in a brace. And they had promised uh, their customers that I would do a sketch for each of them. I've I've never promised sketches. I don't do conventions. That's a lot. That is a lot to ask of anybody. It, well, it's I mean you don't ask a writer to do it. No. You know, but. <laughs> But to, to like the, to ask an artist to, uh, you know, oh, by the way, you're going to do this for free. Um, it's it's a big ask. And if if 
And That's you know, bonkers. I really don't have a problem with it. I love doing anything for the people that support our work. But my favorite thing about being at a show is an eye to eye conversation with the people that I'm there to meet. And if I'm even doodling, I don't get to look up. You know, it's, yeah. I lose my concentration and it's very awkward. And, and so early on, I figured that out. And that's why you'll see in the first two or three years of my career, there'll be stupid little doodles I did. And then I just, I just hated it. It was because I wanted to be in a conversation. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, it's a yeah, very, I think if I had to choose in meeting a creator, I, I guess I feel like I would prefer to have some small connection, like even just saying hello over watching them draw. Which yeah. is cool, but it's its own thing. Like I'd want to like feel like I made some small connection and got to thank them or something. That's a yeah, and and you're not going to get anything spectacular in that situation, even if I were to yeah. do it. And that right. that when I would see uh, these crummy little doodles, you know, online for mm -hmm. sale, so it, it right. didn't even mean enough to this person oh. to hang on to it to keep it yeah, yeah. that's so, a good point and even would have their name on it you know to whoever so um it so yeah i just it was uh it was one of the best decisions ever made because ever since i've been able to to really relax and enjoy meeting mm -hmm. everybody and we don't we don't limit signatures we don't mm -hmm. uh, and we don't charge for signatures Okay. So we've had people come in with dollies with every, everything I've ever done. And of course, if there's a line, I'll do a few and then they'll go to the back of the line and come back again. And it works out. I've even sat outside after a show on the curb, finishing signing everybody's books before. Really? That's amazing. Yeah. I, I enjoy that. For me, the signature on the book is my thank you. So, and, and I, the only re way we would charge for signatures if there are multiple copies for sale, you know, to that makes to, sense. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Something if something is there with something of mine, absolutely. I'll sign it for you and won't charge you. And, um, but yeah, that, that was crazy awkward because what happened was in <laughs> that is why they contacted the organizer and we were supposed to be there for two days. Sure. And we were kicked out of the hotel the next morning. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was fishing, but I got a story. I appreciate that. <laughs> but then, but the organizers set us up early at the next stop, which was I don't know, <laughs> like somewhere in France or something. But uh, so we didn't get to see as much of Belgium as we wanted to. But you know, um, your career, you 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 hit the ground, both writing and drawing uh, your own material. You know, obviously, you're you're just as much of a writer as you are um, an illustrator, or a cartoonist. So I am kind of curious, what does it take to interest or excite you for when you decide to collaborate? You know, it, it, it's interesting. You know, like the the people that you've chosen to work with, like you know, your your Peter Milligans, your Dan Slots, and now your Mark Russells. I'm just kind of curious, like you know, and especially like a bunch of them are, are often. Um, a little bit younger and up and coming, I would say. Um, but but is, is that you just like wanting to give to the industry? Is that you getting excited by somebody's pitch? Is it like a con connection at a convention or is it like a, a mix of everything? I would say it's almost always the pitch. It's okay. almost always the writer and the editor or the editor, um, like in the case of iZombie, Shelley mm. Bond and Chris Roberson together. But um, uh, in the case of Dan Slott with, and Tom Brevoort with Silver Surfer and uh, Mark Russell and Brittany, our editor uh, with Superman Space Age, they uh, approached me with, hey, you want to do Silver Surfer? This is, uh, uh, we think you'd be great for this. Hey, you want to do Superman? This is the idea. And it, it's exciting. Or in the case of uh, Mark Torello, who was the art director at DC, he would have, always, it was always a yes with Mark. It didn't matter really? what it was because okay. that he he Batman Black and White, um, yeah. DC Solo, uh, Wednesday Comics. These were the things that Mark would always, you know. And finally, I was like, "You call, it's a yes," because it was always fun. And he always had a fun idea of who to put together. And now, like hmm. with uh, Wednesday Comics, it was Neil Gaiman and I, who, of course, yeah. we'd worked a couple of times before, Sandman, Sandman. and everything. 
Um, so that that was yes, of course. But um, in in the case of FF, Matt Fraction, I became friends with Matt because we would be at Randy Bowen's party, and uh, uh, Randy Bowen's a sculptor, it's and sculptor, he would yeah. have big parties, and all the organites uh, would uh, gather there, and uh, really hit it off with Matt, and then. Um, uh, started looking at his comics like, man, I, I'd love to work with you sometime. And so then he personally said, Hey, I've got this pitch in for FF. Hmm. This is what I'd like to do uh, with you. You want to do this? And at that point it was an absolute yes, please. Uh, why is it, have you ever figured out why does the Pacific Northwest and really Oregon specifically have such a large pool of comic book talent I, I it's like as soon as you leave new york city it, it it seems to me from my travels and where i've lived all the, for some reason oregon has a lot of talent i think it's uh, the, the northwest in general mainly because first of all how you're treated because okay. dark, i think it's almost entirely because of dark horse comics and my oh group, sure sure setting up in the milwaukee oregon area early on Mike Richardson is one of the kindest, most generous. Mm. He, he'll put together events. Uh, he will, like, he, he for a while, they did their own conventions, Dark Horse did. And, and if you're a guest, you're then invited to uh, a party be, the night before the actual show. And oh, so wow. you're there with the other guests. So uh, one, one year, we got to spend hours hanging out with Mark Hamill. He, he was there with the uh, <laughs> Black great. Girl. Yeah. Yes. So yeah. We're all just hanging out with Mark Hamill <laughs> and hearing all these fantastic stories, all of his adventures and not just Star Wars. He had a pretty light, like he was in an episode of the Partridge family, for instance. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. you got all these great anecdotes of all these other things that he'd appeared in and been a part of. And, and uh, he did a movie called Corvette Summer, which I, I really like. And I remember uh, that's where he uh, broke his nose, came back looking a little different in Empire Strikes Back. That yeah, was it. Was actually right after, uh, yeah, in between. So yeah, uh, in anyway. between. But yeah, but uh, sorry, stuff like that. So <laughs> if you if you if you were aware of that, you um, so look look at uh, all the people that Mike brought in. You know, Frank Miller, Mike Mignola, Art Adams, right. Daryl. Right. Um, and every time they would come to visit, they just loved being in, in Oregon. And then okay. also the uh, the more um, uh, independent, you you could then yeah. get Fantagraphics. Fantagraphics is a b big pull, and so a lot of people who to attracted to Fantagraphics would move to the Northwest. And that makes sense. Uh, yeah, that makes sense. I never thought about it, but I'll say, like for for those who may not live around here, if you ever go to like Portland, you are going to be surprised at just how many comic book stores there are. I feel like there's got to be more comic book stores per capita for for Portland than any I other think, city these I days. Think that's official uh, bookstores in general per capita. Yeah, I think I I read that somewhere. Yeah, yeah. you got Powell's and stuff. Um, Powell's yeah. the, the largest indoor bookstore I think in the world. They give you a map. <laughs> yeah it's been one of my favorite things since I, like i moved out to the pacific northwest of the seattle area about 10 years ago but that's been one of my favorite things is that there's a solid um sort of comic and book and uh, and art community around here it's very nice but, uh, other publishers uh, as well um since uh so dark yeah, image it. now is 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 up here technically there's fantagraphics like you mentioned oh, yeah oh. Um, so yeah, uh, on and on it's, and a lot of, uh, publishers have satellite offices in Portland. <laughs> Just amazing. Um, and which makes sense because you get hands-on with all of the talent that, that is just running around here. We touched, uh, here and there, um, uh, on you doing various things. Uh, you, you, you've worked on Batman with black and white, the solo, you did the Batman 66, and now you're going to do Batman dark age. Uh, with Mark Russell. Now, you guys did something really special with Superman Space Age, the idea of sort of following a character, essentially aging in real time, connected to real history. It, are you guys going to touch on any of those same ideas with Batman Dark Age, or is this something completely different? What can no, we expect? It, it, it's of a piece. Okay. And and it's not it's not redundant in any way. It is It is surprise after surprise after surprise. And yeah. it's it's a beautiful companion piece to it, and we have a trilogy in mind, and that's all I'm going to say about what what our third it, what 
we proposed for our third. Um, but I love it. Mark That's is so exciting. Um, Mark is a uh, an organite and has. Oh, come I didn't down. know that. Okay. Yeah. So he uh, uh, after um, uh, I was pitched Superman Space Age, he came down, stayed with us. We walked around town, just talking it all out. I gave wow. him an Animal House tour because Animal House was filmed just off our hill here. Well, okay. <laughs> I always love giving people an animal house tour, whether they like the movie or not. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so we just bonded. Just uh, I, I just clicked with Mark beautifully and love working with him. It's very exciting and comfortable and invigorating. And, and, and to be able to full on play with my Batman in this way, mm -hmm. like constantly tweaking his costume and his gear and just subtle yeah. Changes almost constantly throughout. He did that in space with Batman in Space Age. Yeah, very was, different sort of like you know cowl connected to the chest, and I and it, it made a lot of sense. It, yeah. yeah, we've had you time, see, I guess, to to think about how something like that might work. At one point, he's in uh, uh, his den, which looks very much like the TV show den. Yeah, yeah I noticed. <laughs> you see under Under Armour. Yeah. Um, but anyway, uh, that it's there's just so much wiggle room to play. And I'm loving it. Um, and oh man, why do you see the variant covers? Like we just got Frank Quietly, oh, okay. and it is amazing. Like I like my Batman to have big ears. And, yeah, and, sure. And, and when uh, when Vin asked me, um, what how, what do you want me to do with this? I do whatever you want, but I like big ears. So he <laughs> he gave me his Batman with big ears, big bat ears. I want him to look more like a bat. So, I get it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, if we go back, like to uh, you know the or early Bo uh, Bob Bob Kane, I'll call it, uh, Batman, like you know the ears stuck out a little. The, those nineteen fifties or nineteen thirties and forties serials, so they they stuck out a little bit more, like a bat. Yeah, yeah. 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 sort of went away from that. It's, but and um, you see the natural progression because with ours, of course, it's first it's first a tech suit. It's like a army project. Yeah um a defense project and so they these radar things on his head become ears and and then he's inspired you you see the whole bat cave inspiration in childhood and all that and yeah it's it's there's so much film, familiar at the same time it's so fresh i yeah. i just hope people love it as much as we love doing it you know, I, I I'm primed to to like it because I sincerely thought Space Age was something special. That was that was a really really interesting uh, take on things. Where, um, you know, uh, grounded in the sense that we're dealing with real issues and we're dealing with people aging and getting more responsibilities. But it didn't feel like you know a deconstruction where things were all just sort of grim or anything. It was still like you know had the the the, the fun of superheroes were superheroes. I liked it. I liked it quite a bit. Good. Um, let's go ahead and talk about OAX, the Original Art Expo. Um, and I'll start this by by just, I, I would love to, to let you know that like, you know, um, I think that owning original art from somebody that you like love and respect their work is is exciting. Um, to me, I, I take, I, I have a very small collection, but it's an almost spiritual thing where I will every once in a while just sort of look at it, try to look at like, you know, the pencil work or like what kind of brush strokes they're using. I One of the first pieces I ever got, Mike, a page from uh, Madman Adventures number three. So that that that's a very special thing for me. Um, I, I'm, I promise I'll take very good care of it. I promise. <laughs> what attracts you to the idea, though, of attending a a convention like this? This is a convention dedicated to original art as compared to just comics or something like that. Now, obviously we've got a lot of amazing comic creators. I'm talking a lot, so I won't just list them all, but like what attracted you, you and Laura, uh, to attending this, this new convention? Like what was the appeal? What was the, what was the hook? When we started out, we went to every show possible, whether we were invited or not. And, and of course, so we were at the first, uh, our first San Diego Comic-Con was in the old building before it moved into the massive space it is now. Wow. So our second okay. San Diego yeah. Comic-Con was in that space. And then each year we saw them take down a wall and move it bigger and bigger and bigger. So we saw that happen. And of course now it, it takes over the whole town. But what has happened is comic books have been kind of shoved to the side. 
there's so much going on um, that the art gets mm -hmm. lost and the artists get lost. And I was telling you about that Quebec show that those smaller shows were some of the best times we ever had because yeah. In, the, in that case, the people that show up are the people that really love your work and want to talk about it. And you have more of an opportunity to, to, to spend that quality time and, you know, have these exchanges. And a lot of these people that supported our work early on are some of our best friends. And we look forward to wow. seeing them at any, any opportunity. But what has happened, it, it becomes less... It, it, it the, we've done fewer and fewer shows. In fact, I think um, we were averaging maybe two state side state side shows a year, okay. and then the pandemic just uh, took changed the, everything for everybody. Yeah, took the ha uh, habit away entirely, and I right. think we've done one a year since. Mm -hmm. And um, because we've we found uh, with social media and whatnot, we can have a more of a positive interaction and not the clutter not the uh, confusion and um, and where we, and so anyway, I'll, long story short, uh, when when uh, Bill, uh, comic art fans uh, pitched this show, right. I was like, wow, I, that, this is exactly what I wanna do. It is, it is artists with their art. Mm-hmm. Period. You go to this show and you will get, you look at the guest list. I mean, I am not offended if you're not a fan of mine. Oh my God. The the, the guest list is incredible. I mean, Funny. Jose Luis Garcia Lopez, uh, you know, Brian Stelfreeze, Kevin Nolan. Like we've got some huge, huge talents attending yeah. this you, thing. You can go on and on and on and on. I could. Uh, I'm not trying to leave anybody out just so much as like, just sort of like, it's, you, it's amazing. The show, there's not going to be all these crazy distractions. And also me selfishly, uh, a, a lot of these folks are friends of ours, you know, um, like yeah. Nolan, Adam Hughes, we yeah. will get to hang out with them, you know, and, sure. and have quality time with them, which is really hard to do with these bigger shows. And um, cause we're all going to be, it, it's really focused on the art form. Okay. And everybody is contributing uh, uh, art for an auction, which is going to be really it's hard on. for me to choose from what I'm interested in. I've already seen what uh, some of these other folks have contributed. Oh, you're saying uh, you will be bidding on some of these things. <laughs> yeah. I will tell That's you who dangerous. That's in, dangerous. I don't, I don't want any competition, but <laughs> it just looks like a lot of fun. And yeah, across the street from Universal Studios. Oh, that's and, fun. That's fun. And uh, unicorns hop from uh, Disney World, which we've never been to. Laura grew oh, up four miles from Disneyland. Nice. We we have Disneyland memorized, and I'm really excited to compare Disney World and see what how they you know. Disney World is bigger. Disney World yeah. has, has, is bigger. That's for sure. Yeah, I I, I I've, I've sort of, uh, I'm a big Tron know. fan. So oh yeah. Well, then you'll have to go to someday the Disney in Shanghai. They've got a ride there, like just in the Shanghai one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they just needed to have a comic convention there and invite you. It's as easy as that. Yeah. No, I was talking to um, a friend of mine, Jim Mafood, who's going to be one of the guests. And he was telling me he got, he got we a love little. Him. He's in you a, love he's, Jim? He's in he should be in the chat, I, I think. Um, yeah, we, Jim's... Were, uh, we were at uh, the Dogma shoot together. Um, in oh Pittsburgh. sure, sure, uh, so of course. You'll see us Kevin on the Smith connection. Movie. That didn't yeah. even occur to me until just now. Yeah, Jim did a Madman piece for us, and yeah, so he's one of those folks we're excited to give a big hug to. And uh, good, you hear that, Jim? You're getting a hug. Um, <laughs> Whether you want it or not, Jim. I've, I've guilted them. In, I've guilted the All Reds into it. Um, and but no but it was interesting. Jim was saying that he he got the sense. Um, that this was somebody in America maybe trying to emulate some of what they're doing with something like the Lake Como Art Festival, where like the focus really is on on the the art and the artist over everything else. And and I hope that is the case. I sincerely do. Um, I I think it's a it's a great idea. It's a great idea. It's something I with the the guest list. I personally would love to attend. For everybody listening, we are talking about it coming up 
this coming weekend, the 20 January 26th through 28th in Orlando. And the, um, I think there's still time to put in proxy bids um, for the auction if you can't attend. Go to Comic right. Art Friends for details. Or go to uh, our, um, like my uh, Insta, not Instagram, uh, Twitter. If, if you, uh, you'll see links or got superpowers.com mm -hmm. as uh, Simon. Um, he has links to how you do proxy bids. I think, I think the uh, cutoff might be tonight. I'm not sure. But anyway. Uh, okay. TikTok yeah, folks. Um, <laughs> hunt it down sooner than later. I'm excited for you. I, 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 I'd love for this to be a success where maybe it was a, a direct connection between readers and uh, and artists and cartoonists and that they were able to uh, get a hold of something that will be a treasure for them. You know that you're uh, putting it in good hands and, and hopefully, you know, um, yeah, or, or making enough money to, to, to justify the whole time. <laughs> I'm doing my best to promote this. It really, it, it, uh, it does feel like it could be something very special. It could become our Angulam, you know. It uh, that would be lovely. Oh yeah, uh, I, right, right. A festival I mean, that, that's that's more about the art. Yeah, I yeah. like that idea. Yeah. So you, again, you wouldn't you you're you're unlikely to be talking up Chow Yun Fat playing Madman in this <laughs> setting. I've changed my mind. I I want Chow Yun Fat. To play I think Madman. I think yeah. It's I, I think that that's a good idea. He's he's a fantastic. <laughs> Uh, thespian, we, we would all be lucky to see him as a, uh, as madman. Um, Mike, thank you so much for giving us some of your time today. Um, you know, like we are, I think you're leaving as soon as tomorrow. So I, I, I will, uh, wrap this up, give you some time to, to get ready, but, um, thank you very much for everything um, big fan. World on Thursday. What about Thursday? I'm telling folks that it come to Disney world on Thursday and you can, Get in line with us and and talk comics while we're waiting for for our favorite rides. <laughs> oh my God! Anybody in the in the uh, Florida area, it, 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 take the all reds up on this. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah. then Friday, a huge chunk of Friday will be at Universal Studios. So perfect, perfect. <laughs> I hope you have a great time. Um, thank you very much for for, for everything. And uh, yeah, just best of luck at this convention at, at uh, Original Art Expo. Okay. Thanks. Take care. Oh, I know. Be seeing you, right? And you. Okay. Yes. A prisoner <laughs> reference is a perfect way to end it. Take care, Mike. Bye. Thanks. Folks, how lucky are we to have had um, Mike stop by and give us some time and some insight into the creative process and what he's got coming up. I know I wasn't engaging as much with you here in the chat, but you know, I've, I've got to focus on, on our, lovely guest. Uh, that was incredible. That was, that was a real treat for me. Um, we have a lot more show and I just thought of something that could like relate to what we were all just talking about. We were all just talking about original art. I got something in the mail last night from Danny Earls. I don't know of how familiar you all are with Danny Earls. He's, um, He's pretty new to the industry. I had the pleasure of bumping into him at New York Comic Con, and he sent me a package, which I'm going to open live. Let's see what it is. I, I ripped it open. I don't want to show his address. Um, thank you, everybody. Um, th that's so nice. Thanks for coming. The best guy. He's a patron saint of comics. Look at all these lovely things to, to say about, uh, yeah. That's awesome. Mike Mike is, is something special, no question. Uh, let's see. So I've got something here. Dare I hope for original art? I don't know. Maybe it's a print? I'd be excited about that. Oh, my God, folks. This is... This is original art. Does anybody recognize this? I think a few of you will. This this is incredible. This means something to me. Look at this, everybody. This is the, the cover that Danny Earls did for G.I. Joe issue 302. This is the original art. Holy moly. 
I would never ask anybody for something like this. This is Danny. Oh my God. I think we, I, I love Danny. I think he's going places folks. Um, you know, Gail Simone really helped uh, discover him re recently. Uh, he's an incredible artist. He's been doing some stuff on, uh, uh, no one with Kyle Higgins. He's doing um, an issue of the Hulk with Philip Kennedy Johnson. But uh, anybody here that watches me knows that I am a big fan of GI Joe. Oh my God. That is snake eyes rappelling down onto two unsuspecting Cobra soldiers. We've got like Cobra. It's some sort of Cobra building in there. Oh my God. Oh my God. How do I even thank Danny for something like this? I, I I'm at a loss for words. I um I I I thought it could be either a print or maybe a sketch since it was flat, you know, like that made sense. I never, never, never would have guessed on something like this. What an incredible gentleman. Wow. Wow. I I barely know what to do. I'm going to set it aside, I guess, because I've got to keep the show moving. Uh that's Snake Eyes Shadow. I thought there were two ninjas. Uh yeah, here. So does that does that look uh okay? Can you see that? Anyway, you're gonna have to get that framed. I really will. Well, we are going to talk G.I. Joe a little bit later tonight because um, two issues of uh, G.I. Joe related comics did come out in the past week. So when I get to the comic reviews uh, later in the evening, we're going to talk about Larry Hama's um, ongoing G.I. Joe book and the new sort of reboot Energon Universe uh, Cobra Commander. But um, that is incredible. That is that is incredible. Hoodie Coco will be so jealous. Yeah, my friend, uh, uh, Rob Irizarry might be jealous too. Let's see, who else? I think that there's somebody else in here that was a, a G.I. Joe fan. Who did I see? It passed me by. I thought I saw another G.I. Joe fan in here. Wow, that is amazing. Wow, very nice. Wow, yeah, lots of wows. Hey! Diana, that's who I thought I saw. Uh, Danny sent it to me himself. Danny had asked my, for my address, but I never, I never would have guessed that he was doing something that kind. That is, that is beyond. Folks, just to be clear, I will never ask anybody for anything free. That is insanely generous. That is some weird hair I've got going on. Wow. Um, can you tell that that stunned me? This is like two very exciting moments for me right in a row. Like, trust me, I am a massive fan of Mike Allred and I'm a, you know, to get original art from Danny on GI Joe, like I'm, I'm, I'm spinning right now. I'm spinning. Um, but here's what I'll do. It did make my hair stand on end. <laughs> um, yeah, it'll be a little tricky. Maybe we can get Danny at some point. He he is in Ireland. So, you know, like we've got a pretty big time difference there, but maybe well, I do have a guest from uh from Scotland in a couple weeks. I'll leave it at that. Maybe you guys can guess uh based on popular comics that are coming up. By the way, how do you like my humongous zipper? That's a pretty good zipper, right? All right. I am flabbergasted. I'm having a night to remember. Let's keep it going. Um, yeah, I've had a Scotland. Yes, uh, I've had a night and it's not even six. That's true. Not Garth Ennis, not Garth Ennis. Let's talk about the news. Look at that. Nailed it with the the, the um, incredibly busy uh, thumbnail. That's pretty busy. Let's get into the news. Time for news. Oh, if Jim's still here, we've got a really talented editor that made us something now I, last week i showed you guys sort of a, a first draft but but check this out check this out ready
How cool is that? How cool is that? Our editor, Jamie, made something very special for us there. Yes, Jim and I are working on a show about trash movies. That 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 That's still a little ways off, but I wanted to hint at it because I was just really impressed with uh, Jamie's edit there. The music's great. Jim's art is obviously great. Uh, so we will uh, we will be doing that on this channel pretty soon. Pretty soon. There we go. Yes, the show is going to be insane. It literally will be insane. No matter what we do, because of the subject material, this show will be uh, insane. Uh, what's a trash movie? Just schlock B-movies. Movies where people try and it still comes out kind of weird. Things like that. Um, not always totally bad. Not always. I didn't hear anything. Was there music? Oh, darn. I had no idea that that wasn't. Um, huh. Okay. Sorry, folks. Didn't realize there actually is music to this, but I guess, I guess it doesn't play from there. Um, whoops. Well, I'll figure that out next time. I'll figure that out next time. We'll move on with actual news. It's going to be a video show. That's why we've got an editor. That's why we've got a uh, Jamie. Um, and we're going to, we're going to do something. It'll be fun. Um, play it again. It won't have music. So nope, not a new channel. I'll put it on this one. Uh, it was silent. I'm sorry, folks. I, I really thought that, um, yeah, it makes sense that this isn't pulling the audio from it. Um, I don't have a way to switch it on the fly while we're live. I'll figure it out for next time. So, yeah, thanks, PowerPoint. It's really more of a StreamYard thing. Uh, but let's get into the news then. So we'll start with a pretty big one. Uh, Ninja Turtles. I love Ninja Turtles. Everybody loves Ninja Turtles. Well, they've got a new creative team, this time confirmed. Uh, no, sorry, EJ. Lovely to see you here. Uh, but, yeah, I, I messed up. So we're talking both writer and artists, plural. Let's talk about it. So IDW did confirm the new creative team. Last week, it was a rumor. Nope, it's confirmed this week. Jason Aaron will be the new writer moving forward. That's exciting. Um, I w That's a good idea. I will post it on the Insta. I will. Um, yes, very fun. And then look at these. this. This is four different artists, to be clear. So what are we doing? IGN got to break this news. It's going to start fresh with a new issue number one. Issue number one is going to be focused on Raphael with art by Joel Jones. Following that, the next month, we've got issue two is Michelangelo with artist Cliff Chang. Chris Burnham takes over in October with Leonardo. And then we've got, um, oh, hold on. I, I started putting that out of order. Um, obviously, I got I got uh, confused. Excuse me. Joel Jones on Raphael, Raphael Albuquerque, Cliff Chang, Chris Burnham. Right? Did I get it right that time? What a what a lineup! After that, Raphael Albuquerque will take over for the next full arc with all of the turtles. So, like, we'll basically get like sort of reintroduced to each turtle. Um, each of these artists sort of got to pick which turtle they wanted to do a story about because they they were connected to it in some way. But uh, yeah, that's exciting. Look, it's the Turtles' 40th anniversary. IDW is obviously trying to bring in some big names, start a little bit fresh uh, with an issue one. Uh, that said, they said that while it's a new number one and it's a good jumping on point, it's not a reboot. OK, we're not starting fresh with a new continuity. Everything that's happened has happened. This is just sort of um, starting fresh. Pretty cool. Uh, got to meet Raphael. That's cool. Promising start. Uh, let's see. Cool artists. I might buy this. I will be. I think I will be. Has anyone done TMNT for each of the turtles in the style of the artists they are named after? I'm sure somebody has thought of that. But uh, if so, I haven't seen it. Look, 80s properties are humongous right now. I would have thought my generation, Gen X, that grew up with this stuff would have been at the point where we're sort of aging out of being the prime buyers for comics. But as we will see with things like G.I. Joe, Transformers, Ninja Turtles, Thundercats, obviously this stuff is still landing in a huge, huge way. But I thought that that was exciting. Um, I, I, I 
like all of these artists, I think that Raphael Albuquerque should be a really exciting um, artist to be the regular artist, or at least for issue uh, the, the second arc of the show. We shall see. Chemdog, very aware. You're right. Tubi is uh, not just free, but has a lot of good schlock. And hey, Gen X, what did we start with? We Like in the last uh, thing, we were talking about uh, our buddy Jim Mahfoud and uh, what was one of the first comics he did? Gen X. <laughs> Peter Pan syndrome. You're not wrong. You're not wrong. Gen X represent. That's We'll never let go. We'll be worse than the uh, the boomers. So I'll stay on the 80s tip. Thundercats number one, folks, is selling like crazy. This is bonkers. Over 170,000 copies ordered by stores. Dynamite revealed that that like that's what they've uh, done so far for for. Um, for numbers on this now they've passed final order cutoff so you know i guess there could be second prints that could like bump those numbers up even more now that i think of it but we're talking first prints but we are talking about uh the variant covers now that's a, an area where dynamite specializes in they've figured out how to make um variant covers for smaller print runs than a lot of the other publishers and they can still make a profit so like kudos to them for carving out that niche that means that they can like you know have um, comic shops say, hey, we'll order, you know, X number of copies if we can choose our own artist and get our own cover. Um, that happens a lot. So, uh, yeah, uh, one of the variant covers, to be clear, Rob Liefeld. Doesn't matter what you think of the guy. He still sells comics like crazy. Just amazing. Just amazing that these numbers. I like this cover here by uh, David uh, Na Nakayama. Yeah, I think it's Nakayama. Uh, Screen Rant posted that this makes the 170,000 copies makes it the best selling comic of the decade. I think that that sounds right. We've definitely had several comics cross 100,000, but I can't think of 170,000 for quite a while. That's a huge, huge, huge number. I, I do want to point one thing out, and this isn't really related to Dynamite anymore, but looking at the numbers, it made me realize we no longer have transparency where pu the publishers and distributors are listing the sales for, for every comic. Um, for a couple decades, we used to get that information. And I think it was fairly valuable to sort of see what kind of trends a book was going on. Uh, but we really only hear now when they voluntarily announce uh, what, um, what they've done and they're only going to announce it when it's spectacular. I, I just am saying if we're talking about numbers, I'd love to see all sorts of like numbers for everything personally, but um, yeah. Yup. Thundercats, Thundercats. Uh, do, do, do. What was some, the, the numbers are impressive, but will it stick the landing? No one's handled this property properly since the eighties debatable i mean that's up to to different fans but certainly um i know that like you know some of the reboot attempts in both comics and the thundercats roar cartoon didn't like land like people expected but here's the thing i will say about this um i i talked to uh nick barucci i, I i'm pretty transparent about the fact that you know we, we know each other now and i talked to him and uh you know nick has been in negotiations with Warners for about 10 years to get this lined up. So this is not anything that's being rushed out. You know what I'm saying? That I, I think that they're going to take their time to do it well. I have a lot of faith, faith in um, Declan Shalvey, especially. Uh, you know, I love his artwork on stuff like Moon Knight, but of course he had a lot of success with his creator-owned comic that he wrote, Old Dog, at Image. So I think that there's a lot about Thundercats that you can trust here. And, and they're clearly going back to basics with, you know, the, the, the original idea, the original idea. Uh, but we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> Thank you, sister. Maybe the sort of omens will give you the numbers you want. That's my little sister making a, a nerd joke. I approve. I approve. 
Hmm. I'm hesitant, especially with the teen rating. Last thing I think this franchise needs is another edge fest like they had with the Wildstorm run. Well, who knows? It's not out yet. Uh, they, they released a few pages. Um, there's some things that I've got a small blind spot on. You know, I saw a little of Thundercats, but I was not into it the same way I was with things like G.I. Joe and Transformers that were coming out at that same time. So I'm, I'm, I like Thundercats. I'm not an expert on it. I'm not an expert. We'll see. I'm looking forward to it. Here's one that surprised me. This comes from Channing Tatum himself, or as my wife once called him, uh, without any irony, Tanning Chatham. <laughs> she thought that that was his name. <laughs> Don't be mad at me for revealing that, Chrissy. Channing Tatum has announced that he's going to play the Max. This was on Instagram, folks. This is something he posted. Uh, yeah, he said that he's going to play Sam Keith's surreal, homeless, weird superhero. <laughs> Good. I'm glad that you appreciate that, Chrissy. I totally agree. Channing Tatum is very good. He's also very good at, at, at comedy. You know, the 21 Jump Street movies or his uh, sort of cameo in This Is The End, Channing Tatum is a very funny guy. Um, But wow, you know, we were all like wondering, is he is he going to play Gambit in X-Men? That never seemed to happen. Uh, I, I don't know how this would look in a live action movie or anything, but he posted this and there were all sorts of congrats to him. Uh, Jason Momoa and Aaron Paul were two actors that I saw like really excited saying that they like the max, the max appeals to, I think a larger spectrum than traditional superhero comics. Some of that is because it's a very different type of comic. And some of it is because of that MTV animated show. I think that that reached a larger audience than just comic book readers. Um, the, one of the producers on the animated show, John Garrett Andrews, said he was excited about it. Um, do we have, like, you know, any other crew announced? No. Do we have a timeline announced? No. Uh, but, yeah. I will say this. Because I was looking at this particular image for a while, I realized, look at this. Sam Keith made a mistake. Look at Julie's feet here. Uh, that sure looks like two left feet to me, unless I'm... Uh, blind. <laughs> uh, Sam Keith is a fascinating, fascinating creator. Very unique. Very, very cool visuals. Uh, so yeah, the Max. Did anybody see that coming in 2024? He does have a memorable design. And as we realize, a lot of it is inspired by um, just this homeless guy, like the stuff that he was sort of like resting by and his dreams, like his teeth here are literally a lampshade. A lot of us looked at the Max. He's not human, so I don't know what that will look like. Artistic <laughs> embellishment. She's a terrible dancer. She's not dancing. Thank you, Kevin. At least one of you guys out there is going to give me credit for, for, for spotting two, two feet. Uh, let's see. Not a mistake. That's her heel. Her big toe is on the far side on both of these feet. That's two, that's two left feet. <laughs> um, I got to keep moving because we got comics to review too. And there's a lot of news. This one bummed me out a little bit. This one bummed me out a little bit. Uh, but it's not as bad as it initially looks. What you are looking at here is called the Go Nagai Wonderland Museum. And that is in a small town in northern Japan called Wajima. And you guys may remember, because it's only been uh, three weeks, uh, on the first, first thing of the new year, Japan got hit with a really big earthquake, really big earthquake, uh, especially on its um, eastern side. And in this small town, that earthquake led to a bunch of fires. And what you're seeing down here is that same museum after that fire clearly some severe damage to this museum. So let's talk about this. Um, Go Nagai himself posted about this. And if you, if you aren't familiar, I think you may be more familiar than you think you are, though. Uh, some of the things Go Nagai has created, Devil Man, Cutie Honey, Mazinger Z. Mazinger Z is 
definitely like hugely influential in the idea of um, piloted gigantic mechs. He really changed some things up with that idea. Uh, I'll, I'll definitely make an episode about him someday. So he posted about this though, and it's surprisingly positive. Let me, let me read this to you. Hearing reports and looking at images of Wajima, my hometown, and seeing how shockingly different it looks now from how I remember it fills my heart with sadness. I have been receiving kind messages every day from people expressing their concern after learning that the city of Wajima and the Gonagai Wonderland Museum were so severely damaged in the disaster. I would like to take this opportunity to express my sincere gratitude to you all. Thank you so much. Here's a really positive thing. He goes, regarding the museum, I believe that many of the items on display have been damaged. However, because I am currently I am a currently active manga artist, no matter how much artwork has been lost, I can draw more. It's really not a big deal. Keep in mind there may be some small discrepancies there due to translation, but his overall attitude was that can be replaced. He's way more concerned right now with the people and the business and infrastructure of the town that he grew up in. Also, I've I I've understood that while the museum had a lot of comics and videos and displays and statues, there wasn't a ton of original art in there. So while some was lost, not as much as you may have expected. So Overall, is just a situation where it could have been a lot worse. But it's also just something I think we as comic fans can sort of relate to. We go, oh my God, you know, a comic book museum burned down. We 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 feel that, you know, we've all lost a comic somehow, and it's it's a bummer. So I just felt like we could relate. Um, but but it's a really positive attitude of going to guy, like, hey, I can make more art. Wow. Wow. Yep, yep. It is a bummer. It is a bummer, but that's a great point too from um, uh, Gozu got to respect his attitude. Um, so yeah, just uh, my sympathies to the people of uh, Japan. And I really hope that this small town is able to rebuild that museum. Uh, Japan, uh, if you aren't aware, has a rapidly aging populace, not a, they're, they're I think more people are dying than are getting born. And a lot of, because there's less people, more of the young people are clustering in cities. Uh, so a lot of the smaller towns really need to survive by having a, a unique tourist attraction, something unique. And, and that's something that was special for Wajima being his hometown. So we'll see. Yes, I was very lucky that I didn't get any earthquakes. I was very lucky. I also lost my collection due to a flood when I lived in New Orleans. Uh, it was very, very tough for, for, for many years. It bothered me that I had like sort of a, a, a huge gap in my collection because I lost so much, but you know, whatever, whatever. Moving on. Uh, we've got conflicting reports on whether there's going to be a She-Hulk season two. Personally, I kind of enjoyed She-Hulk. I know that that isn't the majority opinion or seemingly isn't. I liked it. Maybe I'm crazy. I'd love, I'd like more She-Hulk anyway, but let's see. So first of all, uh, Tatiana Maslany is the star and she was on the Twitch stream Codenames Live, the new class this past week. And she said she didn't think that it was likely that there would be a season two of She-Hulk. She was just asked and she's like, I don't think so. Um, oh, cool. Actually, a lot of people are saying they also liked it. I, I, I get it that it was that's that's the Shield comic that it got meta like that. Um, I'm hoping for that. Yeah. Fair enough. I know a lot of people didn't love it. I, I liked it. It was a bummer. We're not getting season two, but let me continue, Owen. Let me continue. Yeah, she noted the high budget. It cost 225 million to make that season. I don't know what they've spent on some of their other live action shows like Hawkeye and Falcon and the Winter Soldier and WandaVision. It isn't that much. They spent more on this show and it's because of the special effects. You know, they had to have a fully digital character for a lot of scenes. So it, it, it cost more than the average TV show. Movie wise, they could probably have even spent less, but you know, it was like what, eight hours or so. Uh, However, after Tatiana said this, 
both io9 and comic book movie both of those sites said that they've heard that insiders at disney say that the ceo bob Iger is actually still open to a renewal that it hasn't been decided and he kind of liked it so we'll see um glad you liked it too mike and it's always good to see you maybe they should have some more legal stuff uh a accuracy in it that that's that's a fair concern that's a fair concern um and finally the mcu has said that even if they don't get a season two uh you know they've got tatiana maslani in a contract to to do more she hulk and there's an excellent chance that they would use this character in things like avengers possibly another like a fantastic four sequel things like that so like the character is likely to still show up just to be clear so I, I know what you're talking about. The latest Godzilla minus one movie is fantastic, but I heard that the budget has been grossly underrepresented. That like because I've heard a lot of reports that it was made for only like 15 million, but I've heard some reports say no, that actually isn't accurate. No matter what, it was done by a director who's also a, a huge special effects guy. That means he went in having a very clear idea of how he wanted to represent things and he planned appropriately. There was like no real waste. It was real. It was a really well done movie. I can't wait to see that in black and white. You, uh, sorry, you liked it too. Yeah, I liked it too. I liked it too. Moving on. St I'll stay on some, uh, uh, you know, movie adaptation stuff. So is the Fantastic Four cast locked in? Keep in mind, that movie is definitely coming out next year. So let's say uh, Hollywood, I call him a scoopy poopy. That's a new term that I came up for, for an insider or, or a scoopster, a scoopy poopy. If you know something like you've got some inside knowledge, you've got the inside track, you're a scoopy poopy now. All right. So Daniel Rickman, he claims that Marvel has locked in the cast for the Fantastic Four and is going to announce it soon. They have to announce it soon, and they probably will. Here's what he has. Pedro Pascal as Mr. Fantastic. Jessica, uh, sorry, Jessica. Vanessa Kirby as Invisible Woman. Joseph Quinn as Human Torch. Eben Moss Bachrach as The Thing. Uh I don't know how familiar you are with these people. Pedro Pascal, though, he's been in everything lately. You know, he, he's the Mandalorian. He was in Game of Thrones. He's great. Uh, Vanessa Kirby, uh, she's been in stuff like, what, that Fast and Furious spinoff. She was just in Mission Impossible, the latest Mission Impossible. Joseph Quinn was that um, doomed rocker in the last season of Stranger Things. Uh, Eben Moss, Backrack, you he actually was microchip in season one of Punisher, but these days he's really well known for the TV show, the bear. Oh, I like this idea. Cast Tom Hardy is all four members. You don't buy it. I think some of it could be true. If Vanessa Kirby is uh, actually cast, I bet that there will be a lot of references to Jack Kirby as well. Justice for her be good one. I love, wait, I love Pedro Pascal, but I don't see him in this. I have to think about it, but he does have a bit of fatherly energy and that is kind of important for a Mr. Fantastic. I don't know. I don't know. Supposedly Marvel is interested in two actors for Dr. Doom. They're talking seriously with Killian Murphy or Mads Mikkelsen. And yes, uh, we know Mads Mikkelsen already played Kaecilius in Doctor Strange, uh, but he'd be kind of perfect as Doctor Doom. So I think a lot of fans would be okay with that, <laughs> with him playing another. Who is this Pedro Pascal person? You, EJ, I think you're trolling me. You're trolling me. Who's playing Willie Lumpkin? Who's playing Paste Pot Pete, the main villain of the movie? This guy. Who's playing Pace Pop Pete in the Fantastic Four movie and has two thumbs? This guy. Uh, last thing I'll mention is there's also a rumor that Marvel plans to use Doctor Doom in the next Avengers movie. However, uh, there are very good reports that Marvel would not have him be the main villain in that. He would play a part in it, but he would he, Kang would, is still planned to be the villain. 
and Marvel is keen to recast. Uh, supposedly, they're, they're, they're really looking strongly at actor Coleman Domingo, but no matter what, I, I think that they've decided they're going to keep Kang as, as the villain for the next Avengers movies, and they'll just recast. We'll see. I, I think it's fine to recast. Who cares? Yes, Doom should... And and Do, Dr. Doom, I think we can count on him showing up in Fantastic Four first. I think we can count on that. Brian Cranston is Willie Lumpkin. Heister, perfect. Perfect. Mole Man could be fun. Mole Man could be a lot of fun. What is this? This is an official logo, folks. Of course it is. Uh, Rob Liefeld, Last Blood. Does anybody love the word blood as much as Rob Liefeld? Young blood, blood wolf. I, I, I think that there's got to be other characters. He, he, blood strike. He, he's got others with blood in it, right? Well, Liefeld is launching Last Blood. Not Rambo Last Blood. Everybody forgot about that. So he posted this logo to Twitter. Rob himself posted this, and he's, and he's just said, get ready. Okay, I'm ready. I'm ready. Uh, on his podcast, Rob's Observations, he's teased that he's got a mystery project that he's been hard at work on. Hard at work. Uh, <laughs> he said that as soon as he finished the first issue, he decided that that would work better as a second issue, so he went back to create a new issue that takes place before that which just means that when it launches, at least the first two issues should come out in a timely manner. We'll see. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Rob has a podcast called Rob Observations, And you know what? He, he'll just talk off the cuff about stuff he knows in the industry. And um, a bunch of that has definitely uh, panned out to be true. He, he, he talked about... Um, oh, what did he... I think he was the one that talked about Kirkman talking to Steven Yun and revealing that Yun was going to play Sentry. Uh, he definitely knew about Jason Aaron as the writer on TMNT earlier. So, yeah, Rob has a podcast where he just, you know, talks. But it sounds like he he definitely lets stuff slip uh, that he knows in the industry. So, yeah. <laughs> but I don't know exactly what this could be, folks. All I know is it's got the word blood on it. Let's talk about something that excites me a little bit more. Uh, a new Michael Avon Oming book that I think is just the coolest idea. So he announced this to AIPT. They have some good comic book news. Uh, this is his new comic, William of Newberry. And some of the stuff that Michael uh, said, well, I'm excited to have Dark Horse Comics announce my new project, William of Newberry. It's a medieval adventure based on the historical writings of William of Newberry, a.k.a excuse me, I hiccuped, William of Newburgh, who was England's first historian. Full of spookiness, plague, and war, Newberry is a safe place to be scared. Because, uh, yeah, this is an all-ages book. He's changed the character to, obviously, a raccoon, and it's set for May, but it's a, um, it's a historical book full of uh, all sorts of adventure and mystery and spooky uh, spirits and stuff like that. Mike, Mike says that the Liefeld book, uh, issue two before one, delayed forever to the point it's going backwards. It's going back in time. Yeah, he, you're right. Mike Mike doesn't uh, write a ton of stuff, but uh, I think that this sounds cool. I think this sounds cool. He said, get ready because this ain't funny. My name is Mike D and I'm about to get money. I know that one. We're doing uh, Paul Revere. Seeing that horsey and a quart of beer riding across the land, kicking up sand. Sheriff's posse's on my tail because I'm in demand. One lonely beastie I be. All right, I'll stop there because otherwise I'll probably get claimed. Like that was just a perfect Beastie Boys impression. Uh, anyway, I, I think that this looks fun. I'm always up for a Michael A. Von Omi book. Good luck, Mike. I'm excited to see what it is. And as long as I'm talking about interesting books coming out, this one, I don't know. It just it just hits for me. It sounds interesting, so I, I thought I'd talk about it. Zach Thompson is going to write this. Artist 
Nicola Izzo is drawing it. They're doing what they call a neo-noir crime thriller set up in the Arctic. Okay, here's the premise. Unyielding wildlife videographer Bryn Brodigan, isolated in the frigid remote Baffin Island, sees something she can't unsee. In the distance, she witnesses an argument followed by an instance of intense violence between two climbers. Did she just see a murder? I love that. Um, I, you know, it makes you think of, say, uh, Rear Window by Hitchcock, right? Where, like, somebody accidentally sees something that is probably a murder, but do they have enough evidence? Can they make others believe them? Plus, setting it up there in the cold, isolated Arctic, uh, I don't know if any of you guys ever saw the early... Um, Nolan film Insomnia with Robin Williams. It's a great location, you know, very eerie how open and cold and quiet it is up there. I think it sounds cool. I think it sounds really cool. Thank you for, for, uh, yes, I know. I was just hitting it. Yep. Oming rules, a fantastic talent and a really good dude. He seems so great. Um, yeah. Yep. Al Pacino was in it. Yep. Baffin Islands is very rugged. I mean, there's climbers. Yeah. Yeah. Insomnia is a really good movie if you haven't seen it. So is, just to be clear, so is, uh, what did I just mention? Uh, everybody knows Hitchcock's great, but Rear Window is one of his best. It's really, really good. I don't know. That, to, to me, sounds like a fantastic premise you know a, a videographer out there like photographing the wildlife and stuff and then accidentally sees what is probably a murder but like how do you how do you handle that like i don't know that that's i'm excited i think it sounds like a cool premise is all that's i that's all i gotta say available in comic shops april 17th that's pretty soon So uh, here's another thing that's coming up pretty soon, uh, superhero related, but I thought it sounded kind of fun. A House of Brainiac story arc. What's Brainiac up to this time, that goofball? So uh, writer Joshua Williamson, artist Rafa Sandoval are going to make House of Brainiac. That's the second action comics arc uh, that DC had announced back in New York Comic Con. Story is going to go all the way from April through June, crossover with the various Superman family titles, and starts in Action Comics 1064 uh, very soon in April. Uh, the idea is that Brainiac has gathered an army of Zarnians. If you don't know, that is the race that Lobo is. Very, very tough, very strong. They're basically all Superman level strong and, and, and tough. That could be interesting. Uh, we've got weird team ups in, in each of these books Superman teaming with Lex Luthor, Power Girl teaming with Crush. That's Lobo's daughter. Guy Gardner has to recruit Lobo. Could be fun. It sounds weird and we fun and cool. Bottled City of Lobos and a Brainiac Queen sign me up, right? Lobo versus Brainiac, pretty much. Yeah, in um, the original uh, continuity, Lobo had killed all of his people, and I think that he sort of still has, but Brainiac tends to have, you know, bottled cities of, of, of you know, uh, otherwise dead. Uh, he, you know, he, he, he did the bottled city of Kandor from Krypton, right? So I guess he did something uh, with Zarnians. It, it makes some sense. Yes, everybody everybody does know, does know that, that Lobo killed his entire species. Uh, you, can always, you can always bring in a few more, especially with a character like Brainiac. Could be fun. Uh, look at this bonkers thing. Marvel is releasing a red band version of a bloody comic. If you have, you've probably seen before, sometimes there are trailers. Most of the time, if you go to a movie, the trailer has like, a green background and it says the trailer is approved for all audiences. If it has a red background, it's only approved for adult audiences. They, they really don't do a lot of red band trailers, but you might see one if you ever go to like, you know, a, a horror movie or maybe an indie movie, like an art house type movie. Sometimes you see red band trailers. Marvel's doing 
a version of Red Band with a comic book, with this comic book, Blood Hunt. <laughs> uh, so we've talked a little bit before. Blood Hunt is an upcoming series, a five-issue series. It's got a bunch of, obviously, uh, Marvel superheroes, and they're all, go all going up against vampires. Cool. So Blade is important. Uh, Doctor Strange is important. We got the Avengers in there. We'll see. They're going to have two versions, the regular comic book version and the Red Band ver version, which will have more gore in the artwork. <laughs> so the um, expanded version is going to come in a red poly bag sleeve so that it's clear which version is which. Uh, doesn't let like, you know, little kids see something too violent or anything uh, before they purchase it. And so, yeah, each of the five issues is going to get a red band edition. I thought that was just kind of hilarious, to be honest. I thought that was kind of funny. <laughs> Let's see. More gore, but never, ever more sex. No, no, no. We don't approve of that. Hmm. You're right, Care Bear. You can find Red Band trailers um, on like YouTube and stuff. That that's definitely true. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see. I don't think the regular version will sell that well when people can get the other one. I I kind of agree. <laughs> people are gonna want the more violent version. Who wouldn't want that? Who wouldn't want that? Yeah, DC did do uh, DC versus vampires, and now Marvel can do it. Um, the only thing I'll say is that, you know, Marvel definitely has a dedicated sort of vampire history with, you know, their long running tomb of Dracula book blade and Dracula have a much bigger history than sort of like uh, DC does with vampires. So, you know, you're playing up on something. Is the art any good? Well, it is Pepe Larraz. And I think that Pepe Larraz is a fantastic artist. So actually, this is definitely one of the stronger artists in Marvel stables these days. It does feel like a 90s gimmick. But but I kind of agree. I'm like, yeah, all right. Guess what? I was probably going to read this. I'll definitely get the, the, the red bag version. Of course I will. Of course I will. There's nothing that violent um, on the cover that they're covering. We, You can look it up. It's, it's just the people. Anyway. Right. Morbius, uh, Andy Brining says, Marvel has a little bit more vampire lore to play with is all I can say. And that could make it work. Uh, also, Jed McKay has gotten a lot of acclaim for the stuff he's been writing like Moon Knight. Um, I read some of that Moon Knight stuff lately. I totally get it. I totally get it. Right. And Chemdog points out the Marvel one isn't out of continuity. The DC story, you know, what if type stories, Elseworld stories are fun, but this is actually like happening in the ongoing continuity. Did they do uh, Marvel vampires in an Ultimates book? If they did, I don't think I caught that one, Mike. Although I love Steve Dillon. So, huh. Interesting. Uh, moving on. Fantagraphics is celebrating a Marvel legend, Joe Manili. Not that many people know about Joe Manili compared to how many should. He's definitely a, a vastly underrated artist. And in another timeline, Joe Manili would be a guy that you'd put up there with like, you know, um, Jack Kirby and Steve Ditko and John Romita Sr. He'd be he'd be a Marvel guy that like did a lot for them. He would have been, if not for the way history went. Stanley loved working with this guy. Well, we're going to get to see some of his art reprinted for the first time. Uh, so just this week, Fantagraphics released this uh, huge tome. It's called the Atlas Artist Edition Number 1, Joe Manili. Uh, Atlas was, probably a lot of you know, uh, before it was called Marvel, it was called Atlas. Before it was called Atlas, it was known for a long time as Timely. Same company, they rebranded themselves. Atlas was this sort of like middle period where they didn't focus a lot on superheroes. They were doing almost every other genre. Westerns, sci-fi, horror, comedy. They were doing everything. This is 256 pages. It's got 38 complete Golden Age stories, 11 of them written by Stan Lee and have never been reprinted. So 
first time for many people getting to see this stuff. Uh, these are all pre comics code stories. So Atlas was, you know, as out there as any publisher. Um, and some of the stories in there will be like uh, kid Colt. Uh, Speed Carter was a sci-fi character, kind of like Flash Gordon. Combat Kelly was like a World War II book. Uh, Crazy was one of the uh, two Atlas humor books like Mad Magazine. They did Crazy and they did Riot. Uh, and one character that ended up sort of making it into comic book continuity, The Black Knight, um, which was really just a historical adventure book, but like eventually did get rolled into Marvel continuity. Um, Joe Manili, uh, who, who he's co he co-created characters like the Ringo kid. That was a long running, uh, Western. He co-created black Knight, uh, and Jimmy Woo, Jimmy Woo. We've seen, uh, he eventually joined shield. He's been in the, uh, last couple of Ant-Man movies. He was in a uh, WandaVision, uh, Jimmy Woo. So what happened? Well, he was like Atlas's top artist in a lot of ways, but he died at only age 32 really young, uh, 1958 train accident. Yeah. Yep. He fell off a subway platform and into the path of a train. Yeah. Very sad. Very, very sad. Trust me. If he had not as great as like, you know, the guys we got, like, you know, Jack Kirby and stuff, I bet Stan Lee would have pitched tons of his ideas for superheroes to Joe Manili. I just feel like that definitely would have happened and that Joe Manili would have been one of the founding um, artists of, of Marvel superhero history. If things went in a different way, who knows if that's better or worse, it didn't happen, but um, super young, still did a lot, really, really popular artist for his, for his era. Oh yeah. Here's a quote about it. Having lost his glasses the week before he evidently had difficulty seeing clearly as he walked between two of the commuter cars and fell onto the tracks. He was found still holding his portfolio. Anyway, um, it's sad. He did a lot of great work and I thought it was cool that Fantagraphics has been able to partner with Marvel and put this book together. I think if you're curious of fig trying to imagine a, what might have been, you should read this book and go like, oh, wow, can I imagine this artist drawing characters like Thor or Spider-Man or, you know, things like that? Oh, look at Jim. Uh, Manili is amazing. This book is going to be excellent. Looking forward to it. It is out. It came out this week. So just to be clear, it came out this week. I do plan on getting a copy. Um, probably the next time I actually go to Fantagraphics uh, store. But yeah. Pretty sad. Pretty, pretty sad. Can you, 32, I can't even imagine. So young. Here's sort of a happy ending to something. Uh, we had talked about this store. Time Warp Comics in Boulder, Colorado got robbed. It had 22 super valuable uh, old books broken in, like they broke, uh, the, the person broke the case and stole them, okay? But they caught the guy. So, so this has been adjudicated, so I don't mind using real names. Uh, James Dobbins Ware, he was only 35, he pleaded guilty to third-degree assault, which is knowingly and recklessly causing injury, uh, and second-degree attempted burglary of dwelling. Uh, the other charges were dismissed. So he had stolen about $13,000 worth of comics and caused about $3,000 worth of damage. Uh, again, Time Warp Comics in Boulder, Colorado. The uh, victim actually said to the court, "Did not want the did not want um, James to uh, do jail time over this. Did not want him to do jail time over this. Pretty generous, all things considered. Uh, where it's stolen twenty two comics, like I said, and then he sold them to two nearby comic stores. So when they heard about this news, they were able to turn over security footage and." This gentleman had used his real name. Like when they when when a comic store buys something in, it's a kind of like a at a pawn shop. They're gonna try to get some ID and stuff like that just for a little while to be sure that you didn't steal it. But he did steal it and he got himself caught pretty fast. Got himself pretty pretty fast. Um, yeah. 
all these comic shop thefts are likely causing some large detriments to the comics community at large as they cause more shops to go under. And most areas don't even have any for miles already. Totally agree. Um, all things considered, you know, I, I think most, most of the people involved were made right uh, or close to it. You know, everybody lost a little. This guy is definitely on some sort of probation, and I think he has to like pay some restitution, et cetera, maybe take some community classes, like you know, classes or do community service, but he's not going to prison. He's not going to prison. He's lucky. He's lucky. Oh, right. Um, no. So <laughs> I, I, the reason there wasn't a new comic tropes up this past weekend was I did have jury duty, but it was so boring folks. I did. I, I, I basically just had to wait around with about 30 other people or so in, uh, a courtroom while they waited to, to give us a case. Uh, lots of, I, I'm just guessing here, but I think there was a lot of last minute stuff going on with the, um, uh, lawyers on both sides. Ultimately, we got told that there was a continuance. That means that the trial date got pushed back to a later date and we all got dismissed. But it did take up a bunch of my time this week. I just had to sit around quietly in a room. It was awful. It was so boring. So, so boring. Um, at, at a certain point, I was like, yeah, fine. You know, I, if I can't do any work, give me a case. G give me something to do. Uh, all I did, I had my phone. I had my phone. Do a follow-up to my superhero video? I may. I'm If I do, I'd probably more likely tell it in comic book form if I tell any more of that story. But maybe. Yeah. So I don't have an interesting jury duty story. You know what? There's a part of me that's also glad about that, um, Crichton, because it would have been... It would have... It, I'm a very empathetic person and it would have been hard to to you know know that i'm i've got somebody's fate in my hands to a degree it would have been hard it would have been hard uh so i sat around for a bunch of days doing nothing and uh that's what happened let's wrap up the news this surprised me uh beckett beckett is one of these grading companies and they have announced something that seems controversial, at least if you look at social media. Uh, they, they're gonna they're gonna grade manga, like the actual Tankaban volumes, you know, like the um, stuff like this. These little things that are more like books than periodicals, you know. So here's what they did. They announced a new offering that they're describing as an industry first. Uh, they're expanding their comics and collectibles grading service to cover manga. Uh, basically, it's $30 for the standard service and for $20 more, like $30, they'll grade it. For $20 more, they slab it in a special plexiglass slab. Okay, well, there were concerns right away uh, uh, all across social media. It seems like the majority of people don't think it's a great idea. Comics Beat talked about it. The, the concern here is it doesn't necessarily need to be done. It's less of an audience for buying and selling old manga because if it does well, they, they mostly reprint these things. It, it, it doesn't, some of it can become valuable when it falls out of print. You know, maybe the American publisher loses the license or it's, you know, they let it lapse and they don't print anymore and people still want that, right? Um, Katsuhiro Tomo's Domu was published by Dark Horse Comics, but is not in print anymore. That's got some value to it. Although, to be fair, that was published as a floppy. But these don't generally retain as much collectability because they're more like books. They, they just get reprinted as needed. Most of the time, okay? Most of the time. So if um, people start investing in this stuff, the concern is we've seen the comics industry get hurt by speculation booms. It's not a bad thing to collect and to trade and to grade. It's not. Unless 
there's too much focus on it. And if this is sort of seen as the new big thing by people that don't that aren't as familiar and are only getting into it as an investment, eventually they'll realize they can't flip things quickly. They'll leave and that craters the audience for a while. Like because it's building up all these like print and then boom, it can hurt it. It can hurt it. Um, so manga does have a secondary market. I'm not saying that it doesn't. But also on top of that, the way these are printed, they don't tend to degrade the same way that these flimsy, floppy uh, monthly periodicals do. These tend, these tend to be easier to keep in good shape, and the paper can age over time, but it generally doesn't age as badly. So does manga need to be graded? Eh. Debatable, debatable. I, I kind of agree with JL here. Manga is successful because it is story first. Collectors are an afterthought. I, I think that that's true. Um, I could see there being a market for things like, say, the Shonen Jumps, you know, like the, the very disposable uh, versions of, of the, the, the manga as they come out in chapters. I don't know. You know, I'm uh, I'm not totally against grading it, but I'm I'm worried about how it gets advertised and to who because if speculators get into the market, um, that that hurts people. That 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 hurts um, stories. Let's see. Here's a scoop for me. I'm officially announcing produce grading. Mike is going to start grading vegetables. Send me your bananas, and I'll slab them and assign a grade to them. The market will decide their value. Well, you better put that in resin too, or that's going to get pretty slimy. Yeah, can you imagine if they ever start grading omnibuses? Imagine if they started grading, like, you know, humongous omnibuses, and you've got it in this, like, thick plastic slab. Oh, my God, that's crazy. We'll see. We'll see. The market will uh, sh shake this all out. The market will shake it out. This is a feel-good story, folks. Patrick Zercher, uh, artist, uh, I think his current book is Solomon Kane. Uh, he's a really talented artist. He's done all. He's worked for all the publishers, but he raised a lot of money for the homeless. So, with the weather getting colder, he rallied a bunch of artists to volunteer. Um, you know, a small commission in exchange for anyone that could show proof that they donated at least a hundred dollars to a homeless shelter. Uh, what a beautiful idea. What a beautiful, beautiful story. Um, here's one where he's saying like, you know, that, uh, he got, uh, Jerry Ordway to donate one, like Jerry Ordway is very popular with commissioned artists. Here's an early post that he made saying that like, look, this is January 15th. So that's almost a week ago. And they'd already raised $4,000 for homeless shelters since the day before. Um, and he's put, he just put the call out there, you know, any artists available that are willing to do it, uh, you know, a commission. It, it, it's not like you get to sort of like request a super detailed, huge commission. You're, you're mostly donating, the, the money out of the kindness of your heart, but to motivate people, Pat, um, Patrick and a bunch of other artists, you know, donated some of their time, which is amazing. Uh, look at this. This one was just yesterday. He said, we raised $10,000. That's 250 coats, a thousand meals, or thousands of toothbrushes and soap bars. Or we just kept the doors open for another month at 15 shelters. I read testimonials from the homeless who said shelters saved their lives. Everyone involved, you're beautiful. Um, I want to thank, and he just shouted out a few artists at one point. Marcus Collar, Scott Koblish, Nick Patara. Love you, Nick. Neil Edwards, Derek Robertson, J.H. Williams. All contributed sketches for donors. Um, pretty nice. Pretty nice. That was beautiful. It was basically just over a week, and they raised $10,000 for shelters. Um, and, and, and at such an important time, it's heartbreaking. If you have any connection to the homeless, you know, like I've grown up doing volunteer work at homeless shelters, soup kitchens, uh, just handouts to the homeless. 
um, it's important to me. These are still human beings, no matter what kind of problems they have, they're, they're, they're human beings and they deserve to live. And it, it really scares me when you have the temperatures drop and, and know how much it hurts people. So, um, that's, it's, it's just really, really nice. I, I don't know. It, it made me happy to see that made me happy to see that. So I thought I'd point it out. Uh, thank you to Patrick Zercher and, uh, and the artists, but really, of course, thanks to all the hundreds of people, uh, that must have donated pretty, pretty beautiful. Uh, as long as we're sort of talking about a little bit of charity, Patton Oswalt and, uh, and his Modoc uh, co-producer and writer uh, helped out a local comic shop to them. So Arsenal Comics in uh, Newberry Park, California, had posted on December 12th, and this is just a small part of what they posted, saying, as much as it pains me to ask for help, I have to put aside my pride and level with you. This location has not been doing well for some time. Fortunately, um, that note was apparently enough to get a lot of regulars and lapsed regulars to come back in, spend some money. They got through the holidays. Uh, that's pretty nice. But also uh, the owner, Timmy Heeg, I'm guessing it had his pronunciation. He reached out to Bleeding Cool, who was reporting on this. And he said, uh, the support we got was quite nice and absolutely helped improve the store sales significantly compared to how they were prior to the post. But we're definitely still not out of the woods and home safe yet. One thing we did not see coming, though, was not just did we get a response from our customer community, but also from the industry. Friends of the store, writer Jordan Bloom and actor, comedian, comic book writer Patton Oswalt reached out wanting to see if we'd be interested in throwing a massive signing mini convention type event to help us get through the slow retail month of January. We, of course, obliged gladly. What soon came to fruition was Arsenal Live 2024. Pretty lovely. Pretty lovely. Uh, that's awesome. Uh, so that that's nice. Yeah, Jordan Bloom and Patton Oswalt. Uh, their their book, um, Minor Threats, was really fun. That was about like sort of C list supervillains teaming up. That was really good. But uh, they also worked on the Modoc show together on Hulu, and they did this for Arsenal Comics, which is lovely. It helped. Always like to see a, a comic book store get a little bit of publicity and, and, you know, just sort of bring the sales up. That's a lot. That's awesome. Here's a wild rumor. Is DC comics going to do their own version of ultimate comics like Marvel has? Well, that's the rumor. That is the rumor. So this comes from your friend of mine, Rob Liefeld. So on his observations podcast this week, here's something that he said. He said, DC is absolutely doing an ultimate reboot. I know people at the helm, the people in charge. A lot of people called, a lot of people solicited to be a part of it. I have mostly spoken to people who didn't choose to go on board. I don't think it's as far along as the Marvel stuff. But according to him, uh, they are, they being DC Comics, is uh, strongly considering doing their own ultimate universe, you know, as in sort of like a starting from scratch, modern take on everything without the, the previous continuity. I don't know. Bleeding Cool, though, did say that they heard rumors that Scott Snyder would oversee something like this. Um, so uh, I think people legit are talking about it. Will it definitely happen? We don't know yet. It's too soon. I do think that if both of these people are talking about it, there have to have at least been some discussions about this. We'll see. That's true, Rob. Rob is not wrong. Uh, they, they they did sort of lightly get into the idea of an ultimate universe, and they called it Earth One. It didn't ultimately have a ton of books to its name. Um, they sort of abandoned the idea pretty quickly. New 52 sort of was that in, in being a reboot, but this would basically more run parallel and not have as much continuity and not as many comics. So we'll see. We'll see. Liefeld definitely still goes to conventions, still works on things. Yeah, he's been in the news a bunch tonight, hasn't he? Um, this, whatever Last Blood is, and his cover for Thundercats. We shall see. 
Uh, almost done with the news. And then I want to talk about a few comics. Look at this. Uh, maybe some of you guys would want to get some free original art. We talked with Mike Allred tonight about the original art expo. Well, Distillery, the new publisher Distillery, is having an original art giveaway. Uh, it's pretty easy, too. So what they've done is they've got a reader survey that fans can complete for a chance to win one of four pieces of exclusive original art. Um, they're all by Distillery founding members. We've got Tula Latte, Becky Cloonan, Mirka Adolfo, and Joelle Jones. Pretty cool. To enter, all you have to do is fill out this little reader survey. They just want to know a little bit more about people. I, I guess that could put you on a mailing list. But for a chance to like win some original art, that ain't bad. Uh, the link stays live until January 31st. So today's the 22nd. That stays through the 31st. So we've got basically uh, a week. A week. And, um, and then winners are going to get notified by email. Uh, no, all the art is definitely original. All the art is definitely original. That's what they say anyway. I don't think that this is digital. I don't think so. I don't know. If you go to Distillery's main page, they show all four pieces. They look original to me. So, thought you guys might want a chance... Maybe you, you don't mind uh, filling out a, a short reader survey for a chance to win some original art. We've got an update on Witches. That's the Scott Snyder jock comic book, uh, sort of a modern day horror comic that is being turned into an Amazon show, an animated Amazon show. Uh, so he, Scott Snyder is the showrunner. And uh, he gave us an update this week. He posted this um, to Twitter. Broke episode seven of eight in the writer's room for witches this week. Next week is our last full week. Can't believe it. Week after, we start talking actual animation, then a break, and then season two. Loving this medium. I'm always excited to see a creator um, excited about whatever they're doing. Uh, by the way, if you want additional info, Scott Snyder has posted to his Substack newsletter sort of a step-by-step -step of how the writer's room works. So, uh, you know, that's something that you can do a paid subscription to. But uh, Scott does do a lot of writing, teaching, and outside of what he does for comics. And he puts a lot of those lessons into his Substack. So you get not just behind-the-scenes info you do get like a lot of lessons in writing. It might be your thing if that's something you like to do. When's he going to release a new witch's comic? Um, I don't know, but I think that they do have plans to do another story arc in, in that world. And animation takes a while, so this isn't happening imminently, but it is moving forward. So that's cool. And the last piece of news, this sounded so cool to me. Kevin Eastman, I love because he did Ninja Turtles. He's just a cool guy. He's got a new comic and it's um, been at other publishers before. It's moving to Image Comics. We're talking about drawing blood. Let me give you some info. So Kevin Eastman basically had this idea and he partnered with David Avalone, who is actually scripting the comics, okay? The story, and, I, and I'm just giving this the briefest nugget of the idea, but it's a story about a comics writer who co-created the radically rearranged Ronin Ragdolls. I think you can sort of see what he's doing there, this being the guy that created Ninja Turtles. Uh, he created that in the 90s, but now this, this comic book writer is in his 40s. He's creatively tapped out, and he's in debt to loan sharks. So this is all about you know, the, the ups and downs of people in the comic book world. Obviously, pulling from some parts of his experience. This book was originally announced at the Comics Pro 2019 Retailer Summit. And to be clear, the first four issues did come out through Scout. Uh, after that, they had a Kickstarter that funded the next four issues. But now it's been announced that all 12 issues so they're going to like reprint the, the the early ones and then they're going to go all the way through issue 12 it's going to come out through image uh it's called drawing blood starts in april 
I think it sounds like an interesting story, but I tend to like stories about comic book writers and artists. Um, I love that book, uh, The Amazing Adventures of Cavalier and Clay. I like the manga Bakuman. I like this, the, the books by, um, oh, what's his name? All of a sudden, I'm, I'm drawing a blank. Dan Klaus? Yeah, Dan Klaus did some stories about like people in the comics industry. I like that stuff. Ha, this is therapy. <laughs> You're probably right. I'm guessing there's a plot twist and the loan sharks don't get him. I don't know. I don't know. Oh, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, Chip Zdarsky's uh, Public Domain is a good comic about comics. I like that stuff. I, I find it interesting. Yep, I'm thinking of Dan Pussy. Pussy. So. Oh, Cool. Yes, I, I've recorded the next episode about a Golden Age hero. Uh, just need to uh, edit it. Yes, Eltingville Club, huge fan. Uh, very funny. Boy, dark stuff. But Evan Dorkin is one of the funniest guys in comics. Evan Dorkin is fantastic. Fantastic. Uh, let me get this out. And I'm going to start another camera real quick uh, so that I can talk about some of the comics that came out this week. I did read Fortune and Glory, but back when it came out, which I think was maybe like the late 90s now or early 2000s. So I don't remember it very well now that you say that. Huh. I'd have to think about that. Uh, let's see. Oh, hold on. <laughs> I have to actually plug the camera in. That would help. I've got a little USB stick here. Plug that guy in. And nothing yet. Why? Why, why, why? Try it now. Still nothing. Awesome. This is going great. Nope. Trust me, folks, I've done this before. Hmm. I am having an issue. Oh, ha! I still didn't plug in the other end. <sighs> Sorry, everybody. I should be more prepared than this, I know. There we go. There we go. You know what? Let's get a little more light on the situation. And we'll talk about some of the comics that came out this week. I'll tell you what I'd like to start with. This one actually came out last week. I, I didn't realize that I overlooked it last week, but... Uh, I haven't really been following most of the um, Krakoa X-Men stuff, but this is issue 41 of Wolverine, and it starts a new storyline, and it's sort of after Krakoa is follow, fall, fallen. This is the start of the Sabretooth War. Sabretooth is back. Now, they, they, they say on the cover here that this is the most violent Wolverine story ever told. You know what? They might be right. They might be right. So it catches you up to speed on what you need to know uh, here. The important thing is this. Sabretooth, Wolverine's like arch enemy that also has, you know, claws and, and you know, uh, healing powers and stuff, has gathered a ton of Sabretooths from parallel worlds. Okay, who cares how he did it? He's got an army of saber tooths. Most of them are mindless drones where they don't have a head. I don't understand that part. I guess it was set up in a previous storyline. Who cares? What matters is there's a bunch of saber tooths being led by the main one. They catch you up, you know, with a blurb up here. And they're going after Wolverine. Wolverine is in at the North Pole with a few of the X-Men after uh, escaping the fall of their island nation that all the mutants were on. Here's an important thing. Uh, he has reconciled with his son, Dawkin. 
Dokken Akihiro, okay? And then what happens? Wolverine goes away to, like, find some shelter or something like that. The Sabretooths attack. And I'm going to just show you. Wolverine comes back, and those are the body parts of Dokken, his son, as well as Scorpion Boy. Sabretooth has a history of doing something horrific for Wolverine every year on his birthday. He's been locked up for many years in Krakoa, but he is free now. There's his army. And he has punished Wolverine about as bad as it can get. That is pretty brutal. Pretty brutal. Uh, and that is just the start of a 10-part story here in Saber Sabretooth War. Wolverine number one. Number 41. Number 41. I'm, I'm interested to see where this goes. I'm interested to see where this goes. It's pretty messed up. <laughs> I like this joke. Hold on. Let me. Yes. We are not, it should be called the saber teeth war. You're right. Cause there's more than one saber tooth. So it should be this. It's pretty messed up. It's pretty messed up. That's a fair um, assessment that the, that's a fair assessment. Then again, Dokken is a supporting character who has sort of been a villain until recently. Um, and you got to like, you know, get some sort of emotional stakes. If, if, I don't know, if they created him just for this, that's worse. Dokken has some interesting history with Wolverine and they're playing off of that. Yeah. Jeff Shaw. Jeff Shaw is a really good artist. His appendage penmanship is awful. I thought I'd mention that because I'll be honest, that hooks me enough to, to be curious to read some more. Let's talk about another controversial thing. I had an interesting reaction to this. So, uh, the Energon universe, that connects Kirkman's Void Rivals, Daniel Warren Johnson's Transformers. Joshua Williamson uh, launched Duke last, well, like a couple weeks ago, really. And now we've got Cobra Commander number one. Obviously, Duke and Cobra Commander are sort of setting things up to get to the point where G.I. Joe is G.I. Joe, Cobra is Cobra. But we're not there yet. This is Cobra Commander's origin in a lot of ways. And it's not connected to previous continuities, okay? It's not based on the cartoon. It's not based on the, the ongoing comic that Larry Hama did. It's mixing that, that stuff up into a new continuity. So we see a couple versions of Cobra Commander in this. In the modern day, he goes around in this outfit, which if uh, you watched... Transformers, you would recognize him as showing up in season three as Old Snake. There's a flashback to him when he was um, younger. Uh, let me show you some. Um, and and that's him. And I, I want to say like version, it's either version four or five of the, 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 the toy. Let's see. Version one and two were hooded and helmeted. I'm not counting like 1.5. Version three was the power armor. So this is this must be version four, I want to say. Uh, kind of a deep cut, but they're using that armor. But where does this take place? If you've seen this in the, in the G.I. Joe animated movie, uh, you'd know this is in Cobra Law. Cobra Law, I guess, has some of some fans, right? Uh, a lot of people don't love it. I didn't mind the movie too much. I thought that the action figures were pretty terrible uh, and it was too sci-fi for me to show up in the regular G.I. Joe ongoing comic. Okay. Cobra law is basically a ancient society that lives deep in the Himalaya mountains. It's like Shangri-La Cobra law. And um, they refuse to use mechanical uh machinery and stuff they they use all organic stuff so it's a very um creepy uh world of you know like bugs and plants and stuff like that that that, that um that serve them well anyway so cobra commander's here does that mean that he's also like one of these ancient weirdos like the 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 cartoon eventually um said uh no no it does not actually uh he confronts 
Galobulus, the leader of Cobra Law. But Galobulus specifically says um, that they pulled Cobra Commander, you know, directionless from the outside world and gave him a new home. So he is not Cobra Law. He is still a regular human being, but he's lived with Cobra Law and he's got access to technology, which, you know, like mechanical technology. As you can see, he's got these like weird bugs that burrow into people and blow them up. Okay. He, this is a Cobra commander that actually is, is fairly competent in a lot of ways. Specifically, he's got some Dr. Mindbender or Destro-esque technical knowledge. This is a very smart Cobra commander. Uh, and where does he get that? This is how it starts to all connect. Uh, Cobra Law somehow got a hold of Megatron back in the past, or at least most of Megatron. And Cobra Commander has been studying this and taking that technology with plans to take over the world and this, that, and the other. At first seeing Cobra Law, I was uh, kind of put off. I don't love Cobra Law. But then I, and so at first I was like, oh, I'm disappointed. Okay. But then I kept thinking about it and I was like, wait, there were a couple elements in this that I really liked. I liked how smart Cobra Commander was, how cunning and, and dangerous he was. I liked those elements. So I went back and reread it and realized that I hadn't been reading it carefully enough and that they do specifically say that this Cobra Commander came from the outside world. And I go, okay, if he lived with Cobra Law, but isn't like, you know, some sort of weird Cobra Law monster, I might, I'm kind of okay with that. And I like the, I, I like that he's sort of betraying Cobra Law's ideals by studying this technology and using it for his own ends. I go, okay, this is sinister. This is cunning. Um, that's a great point, Rob. Yeah. His original file card did list that he was an expert at experimental weapons. They mostly haven't played up too much that scientific know-how, but I like giving him that as part of who he is. He also seems to have been given by Cobra Law this big guy as a um, bodyguard, and I have no idea who this is. He calls him a grunt, but I don't think that means grunt, the G.I. Joe member. I think he's just being called a grunt. Uh, and it sets up that he's about to get in contact with some mercenaries, the Dreadnoughts. I love the Dreadnoughts. So at first I was a little resistant to it, but then I, I, I kind of came around. I was like, no, I kind of like some of the stuff Joshua Williamson is doing to build up Cobra Commander. And I love Larry Hama's ongoing G.I. Joe com comic. Okay. This one's a little less sci-fi. It has some sci-fi in it, but not as much. So I'm not against having a second version of G.I. Joe that connects to Transformers and Void Rivals and everything. Okay. Yes. Uh, sorry. He is searching the world for Energon. He plans to use Energon somehow. Uh, that's the fuel that, that the Transformers use. He's also obviously like sort of like, uh, yeah, he's, he's taken Megatron apart and used his body parts. Um, I like how it's all starting to, to come together. I'm actually in the letter column for that G.I. Joe issue. Really? Good for you. I'll move on to, to this. This I don't have as much to say other than that I like it. Um, let's go to the letters page. Um, we've got R.R. We've got Mark. We're looking for an Owen, huh? Oh, Owen Seiler? That must be you. Look at that. Um, G.I. Joe from Skybound is still a good jumping on point. Larry Hama has been making a point of recapping and resetting who these characters are and what the world is and everything. Uh, there's a bunch of different factions involved than just G.I. Joe and Cobra, but it, it explains all of that. Uh, this is some of the best artwork that the G.I. Joe monthly comic has had. This is Chris Moneyham. And I think you'll agree that, you know, this is some pretty uh, gritty, but, you know, grounded stuff. I mean, you know, taking the time to, to do some realistic technology on a helicopter, taking the time to, uh, you know, give a, like a really nice detailed setting, like the, the Utah desert that the G.I. Joe base is in, uh, 
and, and of course, Larry Hama has a lot of interesting character work. We get to know a little bit more about a character that's been in the comic for a while, Dawn. Um, she grew up with a family in Cobra's city of Springfield. We got some interesting stuff with Spirit. One of the cool things about the IDW run of this book, which continued the Marvel run, is that uh, Larry Hama finally cracked how to use, uh, what do you call it, um, Duke. And, and, and it's nice. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much, Joe. A Cobra Commander impressionation. Oh, how it pains me to do this. <laughs> I don't know. Does, is that what it sounds like? Maybe that was more of a Starscream impression. But Cobra Commander would be like, Destro, I need your technological expertise right now. That's fun. That was fun. Thank you. It was okay. It was a crypt keeper. <laughs> Spot on. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, Larry Hama uh, famously did not use a bunch of the more sci-fi ideas of the toys. He was not obligated to, to include every single toy that Hasbro made. Uh, he did not use Cobra Law. He didn't like that. He Barely used Serpentor. He used Serpentor a few times. There was a great Cobra war between, um, well, technically a fake Cobra commander and, and Serpentor over uh, the army of Cobra. He's brought Serpentor back, but this is technically a, a new clone, Serpentor Khan. And uh, he's very intelligent, very ruthless. And also... He set off this weird genetic bomb that Dr. Mindbender had created, and he's turned uh, himself, Dr. Mindbender, and a bunch of others into essentially really intellig intelligent zombies. They do want to eat people. <laughs> they do want to. So they're a little crazier, but he's he's quite clever. I actually like this a lot. Um, uh, let's see. We've got a few more. Let me go through some of these kind of quick because we're already running a little late. Yep, Serpentor lasted around two years the first time around. I think he got decent use out of him. He did. He he came up with a good story where Serpentor took over for a while and it culminated in Serpentor literally getting killed by Zartan, which was awesome. It was a really, really cool moment. Um, he got some use out of him and now he's brought him back, in a, like, but it isn't the same guy technically. It's just a guy made the same way. He's a new Serpentor. Uh, you, wait, I like this compliment. Uh, I need to do a side gig as a voice actor. I'd take it in a heartbeat if I knew how to break in. Thank you very much. Hey, this is Bobby Kirkman. I understand you want to get a voice role on Invincible. Well, come on down, Chris. Come on over. He doesn't have quite that much of an accent. I'm exaggerating. Arrow in the eye like the King of England. Bunch of you have read uh, G.I. Joe. That's cool. I recommend it, folks. If you haven't read it before, I like G.I. Joe. Both versions. Um, the way you can tell them apart is right now, it's Duke and Cobra Commander are, are in the Energon universe. It'll also have an EU Energon universe logo in it. That, um, you, and uh, I'm sure someday it'll say just G.I. Joe. But the G.I. Joe that's been going on since the, the very beginning... This is the same continuity that started at Marvel back in 1982. Larry Hom has always been the writer, and it's G.I. Joe, a real American hero. That subtitle is important. That that That's what means it's the ongoing continuity from the beginning. Um, Miracle Man, The Silver Age, wrapped up. This was a book that Neil Gaiman and Mark Buckingham started 30 years ago, and then the rights got all weird. Uh, they've reprinted the the like three or so issues that they did and come up with a couple new ones. Uh, what does this do? Well, Miracle Man in this has essentially taken over the world, made the world a utopia, but a utopia under his direction. And into that world, he used this new technology to bring back his former sidekick who, who had died, Young Miracle Man. Young Miracle Man has been the focus of the Silver Ages. He goes around the world trying to understand, you know, he's a man out of time. Um, it, it, it's, it's, it's upsetting and disappointing to, to see, like, you know, he, he believes he grew up, you know, in more of a, a 1950s superhero world. 
Um, and uh, oh yeah, um, yes, it's one of the highlights of, of my career is that I, that I got to interview Larry Hama on uh, Comic Tropes. That was that was a lot of fun. Uh, did I notice the GoFundMe for comic writer Brett Lewis? I think I've heard about that, but I have to admit, I don't think I know who Brett Lewis is off the top of my head. I'm I'm sorry. Um, but Brett Lewis. Okay, so Brett Lewis, I guess, is a comic book writer in need, and he has a GoFundMe. So hopefully by mentioning that, we, we are giving some attention there. Oh, wow. Thank you for the super chats. Let's see. Been watching All Red is Cool. Happy Monday, troopers. Can you do a Bobby Hill? I didn't watch a lot of King of the Hill. Let me see. I've never tried. Dad, my name is Bobby Hill. Bobby, you are a disappointment to me as a son. My dad. Is, I don't know. Uh, no plans to do any more variant covers for Dynamite. I, I, I think that like the Vampirella cover did okay. Uh, I think it would probably make more sense next time to do a full comic that I like, you know, write or something that, that I have. Um, is pretty good. I, I don't really watch the show. I was trying the best. It was solid. Okay, I'll take it. I'll take it. Dad. Wasn't that Pamela Adlon that did that voice though? Um, she's a really funny comedian. Look, here's what's interesting about um, this. I'll, let me skip ahead. What's interesting is young Miracle Man has decided on his role. Look at this. This panel sums it up. I'm going to be your adversary. Not now, but one day. I'm going to be the opposition. If this is Eden, I'm going to be the serpent. And you're going to say yes, because you need me. He believes that it's not right for anyone to have full control of the world. Uh, even if it seems right, you need to have that opposition. You need to have another idea or set of ideas. And he's decided he's going to figure that out. And and it th this ends with him deciding to just meditate under a tree. And he slowly gathers followers that are curious about this new way. Where will it go? I don't know. But that's the story for the always announced you know, like 30 years ago, they said there would be the Golden Age, which they published, the Silver Age, which never got finished until now, and then the Dark Age. Could be interesting. It's, it's more Sarah... Is, is it Pamela Hayden? I thought it was Pamela Adlon for some reason. Um, I could be wrong. I didn't watch the show. Uh, but anyway, Mark Buckingham has become an amazing artist. Neil Gaiman's always a good writer at like coming up with nuanced, believable characters with inherent contradictions. Uh, I, I, I quite like this. I think it's a solid ending seven issue story, technically issue 29 of the overall miracle man comics, but yeah, number seven of, uh, of that. And I also wanted to like, just give a few minutes to talk about Avengers twilight, which I really, really liked. What is this book? Chip Zdarsky writes Daniel Acuna Acuna on art. And it takes place in a near future where superheroes have some the avengers did something that did not go over well and superheroes have not exactly been outlawed but basically banned uh steve rogers had his super soldier serum taken away luke cage is an elderly man that's like one of his few living friends uh matt murdoch is one of the few left alive there's not a lot left alive it's not a totally bleak and gloomy future but it doesn't have superheroes. And what you start to realize is that there are um, fascist elements starting to form in the government. Let me acknowledge this real quick. Um, Finn, thank you so much. Thanks for the great news and reviews. Do you know if you'll be at the any of the days of Emerald City Comic Con this year? Yes, I got a ticket for Saturday. So Saturday only, but I will be there. Um, if you see me, please say hello. Thank you. What? So, so for instance... You could almost believe in something like this happening. There's going to be like a documentary that they see announced on TV, which says uh, history painted Johann Schmidt, famously the Red Skull. I mean, he's a Nazi supervillain, right? We know that. But it says painted Johann Schmidt as Hitler's right hand man. But recent evidence shows Schmidt worked against Hitler, trying to take down the Fuhrer from within the Third Reich. 
uh, sacrificing his own face, his family, and reputation for decades after. So that almost feels like something like a generation or two separated from who the Red Skull was could sort of believe or look at as, as an angle. They're like, well, he was trying to take down Hitler. We all hate Hitler. Boy, it's like, Steve Rogers is like, he only tried to take him down so that he could take over the army, you know, like that. But, but yeah, so like people are like coming up with like weird ideas like that. And at night, uh, there's a curfew and there are some um, so, uh, police officers, essentially, that have um, some Iron Man-esque armor. I was trying to see if I could find that. And, and he finds them like sort of Steve Rogers finds them picking on just a skateboarder that was out past the curfew. And he finally decides to stand up. OK, I'll be on it. So, like, here's how they get away with this is, you know, they're saying, hey, this is in a, the near future. You know, this is this is like almost a generation away. This isn't what today is like. But you look at it and come on, like the problems that they're listing are definitely problems that we can see forming in the modern day in our various governments. You know, we're always, we always need to be very cognizant of the direction um, our politicians can kind of take us. Uh, so Steve Rogers tried to be a Senator, didn't get elected. He feels like nobody believes in him anymore, but Luke Cage is like, no, the world still needs you as Captain America. And, uh, but he doesn't have a super soldier when this begins. Where does that go? Maybe I'll talk about that next month. I really liked it, folks. And certainly, like, you can just by glancing say, yeah, the artwork is, is beautiful. The artwork is great. Really, really good. Really, really good. Oh, that's an interesting take, Kale. Really dug this. I've always been interested in a Dark Knight Returns cap. Almost contemporary, like you say. It really is surprisingly relevant. Surprisingly relevant. Yes, the price. I, I like this. The price of liberty is eternal vengeance. V v vigilance, not vengeance. <laughs> John Dorsey. Well, I had no idea you had such talent. Only a slight step from Cobra Commander to Starscream. Yes. Uh, Cobra Commander will like uh, lisp his sibilance almost intentionally, and Starscream's maybe a, a little, um, a little less high pitched, but they're they're basically the same voice. E e to be fair, uh, can we have some more of that? Maybe at some point, it, it does hurt the throat a tiny bit to do it well, but I do enjoy doing that voice. The only uh, I won't uh, dwell too long on the other things. I will say that I think uh, World's Finest is currently doing a prequel story to Kingdom Come, uh, but it's still written by Mark Wade, who knows this world better than others. So it gives um, it gives another level to Kingdom Come that I think uh, benefits it. And look, at the end of the day, it's exciting artwork by uh, Dan Mora. Dan Mora is just so good. Look at how scary this villain is when he yells. Like, that's a scary face. It's just so clean, sharp angles, good compositions. Um, where there, I, I remember one sort of action sequence of just three panels that I liked. Yeah, I like this, um, where sort of uh, this villain Magog is, you know, like at this angle, but that angle and that angle. But it really flows in a nice way. An insert shot of Superman getting sort of like punched by a little tentacle. Uh, I don't know something angular. It's good. Really nice art. Uh, this is one of the best superhero comics on the market right now. I'm not going to go into tremendous depth because I don't want to just recap a book, but Daniel King is doing something sort of new with the, with Wonder Woman in terms of adding a political intrigue and person on the run angle to it. Uh, and Daniel Sampier's artwork. God, look at that. Like basically... These are two of the best looking books on the market right now. And I say that as a really big Marvel fan, but DC has Dan Mora and Daniel Sampier. And these guys are fantastic. Are all the good artists right now Daniels? Because look, Marvel's got Daniel Acuna. Um, uh, Skybound has Daniel Warren Johnson. Everybody good is Dan or Daniel. <laughs> What's up with that? Uh, in this, Wonder Woman specifically asks the other one. Um, people that have a uh, wonder woman's name or powers and stuff to not get into things with her. So we've got um, Yara, 
uh, Wonder Girl and Donna Troy. Okay. And, and Wonder Woman's like, look, this is my own thing. And, I, you know, for the right to do it by myself, I'm going to battle each of you in the way that you prefer. You know, we do like, and, and, and while she has these battles of like, you know, arrows and, and logic and stuff like that, while she's doing all of that, the evil government that's after her is recruiting her biggest enemies, Giganta, um, Dr. Psycho, Cheetah, uh, Grail, Darkseid's daughter, uh, who else? Silver Swan, Silver Swan. So all of Wonder Woman's enemies are coming together, Angle Man. So yeah, there's a there's a team of like C Cersei. Uh, there's a team. Oh, not not Cheetah. Excuse me, Cersei, Silver Swan, Giganta, Grail, Doctor Psycho, Angleman. Okay, for some reason I thought she yeah Cheetah's not in this, but so, some of her biggest enemies. And while she while Wonder Woman defeats all of her allies and they pledge that they will not interfere, uh, there's a twist to it, uh, which is really cool. Yeah, I like this. Art Hack. Change your name to Dan, apparently. Uh, also, Fantastic Four continues to have great single-issue, standalone science mystery stories, this time with the Fantastic Four's kids, uh, Franklin Richards, Valeria Von Doom, uh, Joe, and Nikki. Uh, they're all like going to a new school. They try to impress their classmates by inventing some new science that gets out of hand. Pretty amazing. Pretty amazing. Klaus is great. Klaus is great. Let's see. Uh, you Wait. You never want Dr. Psycho on your team. It can't end well. That's right. Cheetah had a cameo last week. Cheetah's a good villain. So they don't have like Ares or Cheetah, which are two big enemies, but they have a bunch of our other big enemies, like a team of six Wonder, like six Wonder Woman enemies. You're like, boy, how could Wonder Woman possibly go up against all of them, even though she doesn't know that they're being formed? Well, fortunately, it's more like a team of four Wonder Women. I kind of like it. I, I, it's nice. Oh, my God. Is that who Brett Lewis is? Hold on. Hold on. The Winterman, huh? Because I got this beautiful John Paul Leon artist edition and didn't realize that that was who wrote that. Huh. It only really, it, it, since it's all the art, I guess I had missed that. So Brett Lewis, Brett Lewis did Winterman. Got it. Well, then let's, let's take a minute here. Hold on. Let me find the Brett Lewis GoFundMe and familiarize myself. Thank you for putting that in context for me. Let me look something up. Oh, okay. It sounds like this guy's, oh, wow. All right, let me add something here. Well, that, I thought it was maybe just like needed help paying taxes or something along those lines. Uh, I'm going to add a, a, a um, another panel here to my video. Uh, share screen, that's what I want. So there we go. GoFundMe, Brett's recovery from traumatic brain injury. I didn't know. So he's about halfway to the goal. My name is Jen Graves. I'm fundraising to help cover bills and aftercare for my very close friend, my brother, Brett Lewis. Um, Brett was assaulted in 2009 and suffered a traumatic brain injury. He still has after effects and financial burden from that. Uh, at some point on the night of January 14th, Brett lost consciousness and was found unresponsive with a swollen head from a brain bleed. Oh, I hate hearing that. All right. Well, hopefully, you know, sharing this does some good. Uh, that's, that's upsetting to, to learn Brett Lewis. Okay. And what else did you say that he wrote? Um, 
Oh, now I'm missing it. I, I, I the, the, the comments come in fast and furious. I appreciate that. Uh, duh, duh, duh. Oh, we did Thief of Thieves. I remember Thief of Thieves. Yeah, that was good. Okay. Well, my sympathies to Brett and his family and friends. Um, good luck with this GoFundMe. Jeez. Did we do enough tonight? Did we do enough tonight? Or should we do a quiz? Or should we end it? What should we do? Like, I don't have time to to draw, I don't think. Because, I, I, you know, we got to have dinner at this house at some point. Should we do a quiz? Or should we just wrap it up? Because we've had an interview. We've we've opened original art. We've, we've gone all, through all sorts of news. Oh, my wife says that there's time for a quiz. Quiz seems too long. Maybe. I'll let the audience decide. Tell you what. I know how I'll do it. Let me open up a, I'll do a, um, what do you call them? I'll, I'll do a poll. Give me a sec. I'm going to, I'm going to open it up and do a poll. Give me a sec. <laughs> Just kidding. Oh boy. I'm a jerk. I'm a jerk. View your channel. There I go. And how do I do the quiz? Let me see. How do I do this? Like this? Yeah, engage with my audience. Okay, start a poll. Okay, there we go. Start the poll. Let's see uh, what kind of response I get. I'm letting you choose to either end the show or do a quiz. And we'll see how many responses we get here. We've got 22, 24 votes, uh, 20, 26 votes. A couple people want to end the show. Well, but it looks like most feel like it would be fun to do a quiz. All right. Last week, somebody told me about uh, something called Sporkle instead of Jetpunk, which I've been using. So, okay, 45 votes and we're at 80% to do the quiz. That means if you want to leave... That's totally fair. I do not blame you. It's been a long show, but I'm going to pull up Sporkle and we'll do a quiz. Okay. We'll do, we'll do a quiz. It, it It's pulling past 80%. It's up to 82%. It's, it's climbing. So, okay, we'll do the quiz. We'll do the quiz uh, together. Okay. We're going to do a quiz together. Let me add back this window. I'm on Sporkle and I'm just going to type in comic book to see what kind of quizzes Sporkle has. Uh, comic books by Sox, uh, comic book teams, first 10 members. Can you name the first 10 members of these 10 comic book teams? That actually sounds pretty darn interesting. I might do that one. Comic book characters A to Z, too easy. Top 100 comic book villains could be tough, according to IGN. Comic book to-do lists, comic book characters by three iterations, TV shows by... Okay, uh, you know what? Let, let's end it with this. Comic book teams, first 10 members. First 10 members. We're going to do a quick quiz. So we've got Avengers, Justice League. Can I close this ad? Nope, they're going to just keep giving me ads. All right. Uh, Avengers, Justice League, X-Men, Fantastic Four. Ooh, 10, 10. That, that's a tricky one. Justice Society, Suicide Squad, 87 Team, Legion of Superheroes, Guardians of the Galaxy, Alpha Flight, Teen Titans. All right, this does sound like it'll be a little challenging. Let's 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 kick it off. Uh, Avengers obviously did not initially have uh, Captain America. They had Iron Man, Hulk, Ant-Man, and Wasp, and Thor. And then they added Captain America. And then they added um, Hawkeye. Oh, oh, Hawk for Teen Titans. Then Dove will be in there. Hawkeye. Uh, they also added Scarlet Witch and Quicksilver, right? <laughs> I can type. Uh, mm, Swordsman? Hey, Justice League. Easy. Superman. Batman. Wonder Woman. Flash. Green Lantern, Aquaman, Aquaman, uh, Martian Manhunter. Uh, There's three more. Green Arrow? 
Haha. Black Canary? Nope. Adam? Yep. Hawkman? Got it. X-Men. Too easy. Professor X. Cyclops. Jean Grey. Angel. Iceman. Beast. Havoc. Polaris. Wait a minute. Oh, they're being tricky. Mimic? Haha. -ha. Not clever enough for me. There we go. Mimic and Changeling. Tricky. Fantastic Four. We got four of them, no matter what. We got a uh, um, thing. Let's see. Uh, Miss Marvel was part of the team. The Sharon one. Um, Luke Cage was once part of the team. Who else was part of the team? Medusa and Crystal were part of the team. Who else was on the Fantastic Four? Wyatt Wingfoot? I don't know. No. Jen Walters, Herbie, Morph, The Sun. Who else was on the Fantastic Four? Why am I not thinking? This quiz is easy mode, says uh, <laughs> William Lee. The, the, some of these are easy. Some of them are a little trickier. Who else was on Fantastic Four that I'm forgetting? Oh, Nova. Ha ha. Uh, I'll have to come back to that. All right, Justice Society. We've got Flash, Green Lantern, Hawkman, Adam, Superman. We'll have Sandman. We'll have Our Man. We'll have Doctor Fate. Uh, Wildcat? Nope. Dr. Midnight? Nope. Thundra? Nope. Spider-Man? Nope. Got Dr. Midnight and Dr. Fate, but I appreciate these uh, suggestions. Oh, is it? Wait, Zatanna? I don't think she was on the Justice Society. No. Hawk Girl, maybe. Hawk Woman? Okay. I have to come back to that. Teen Titans. We've got Robin. We've got Speedy. Aqualad. Uh, Wonder Girl. Who else was... Uh, uh, Raven? No. Cyborg? Okay. It's all going to be people before them. Um, Guardian. Yep. Guardian. That's a tricky one. Who else was an early Teen Titans member? Kid Flash, right. Kid Flash, thank you. Uh, Beast Boy? No. It's all before the, the Raven Starfire type people. Yeah. Um, Aqua Girl. Yep. One more. Hmm. Got Speedy. Terra? No, too late. I'll come back to them. There's one I'm missing there. Alpha Flight. This one's easier. Guardian. Sorry, Guardian. Oh, I already put in Guardian. Excuse me. Right, because Guardian for Teen Titans. Ha! Aurora, North Star, Snowbird, Sasquatch, uh, Shaman, Talisman, Puck. Uh, who else was on? Oh, Marina. Yep. Guardians of the Galaxy, 2008. So we've got Star-Lord, Drax, Rocket, Groot, and Gamora from the movies. Who else? They probably had Adam Warlock, Quasar, Silver Surfer? No, not Silver Surfer. Uh, Moon Dragon? No. Mm, I have to come back. Box? No. Oh, we've got all of uh, North's oh, Alpha Flight. Guardians of the Galaxy. Captain Universe is a good guess. I'm not sure, though. No. Nebula? No. We already tried. We've got Manta saw in there already. Yeah, she, she was in um, the Avengers, right? Oh wait, no, Mantis. Excuse me. Oh, Bug. Not Yondu. Uh, Vance Astro. Vance Astro. Somebody said Yondu. Made me think of. Okay, so yeah, major victory, Vance Astro. Okay, Legion of Superheroes. Some of these will be easy. Some of them are going to be tough. Saturn, Girl, uh, Cosmic Boy. So there's the uh, and of course Superboy. But um, uh, Invisible Kid, Colossal Boy, Matter Eater Lad, no, uh, Bouncing Boy, no, 
Sun Boy. These are good guests. Triplicate Girl will be in there, and probably Phantom Girl. Phantom Girl. Karate Kid? No. Chameleon. Either boy or kid. Yep, Chameleon Boy. Timberwolf, I think, was way too late. They had another weirdo early on. Ultra Boy? No. Mon L is a good guess. You guys have good guesses. Shrinking Violet's a good guess. No. I've never heard of any of these, says Django Fett. Lightning Lass? We got we only got three and a half minutes. Okay, let's do Suicide Squad. We've got the founder, right? Amanda Waller. Rick Flagg. Oh, uh, uh, Captain Boomerang. Bronze Tiger. Blockbuster. Plastique. Who am I not thinking of that was um an early suicide squad? Oh, Deadshot. Uh, oh, somebody says Brainiac 5. I don't think so, though. I think he came, yeah, way later. Triplicate Girl? Didn't I put that in? No. But, it, yeah, I put in Triplicate Girl. Oh, Enchantress. Yes, Enchantress was on the team. Uh, so I'm thinking of, there's two obscure ones. Count, not Ass Blaster. Um... Okay, so so what have we missed? We've missed one member of the Fantastic Four that joined before She Thing, but after Nova. Because this is an order. This is an order. Got Bron Bron Bronze Tiger. Oh, Nightshade. Yep, Nightshade was on the Suicide Squad. Thank you for that one. Uh, whoever, who threw that in? Um, I missed it, but thank you. Nemesis. Nemesis is probably on this. Thank you, guys. Couldn't get it without you. Okay, so we got all the Suicide Squad. We're missing a couple for Justice Society. I um, uh, just thought of one. Uh, what's his? Thunderbolt. Yep, Johnny Thunderbolt. Uh, but we're missing one for Justice Society, one for Fantastic Four, one for Teen Titans, one for Legion of Superheroes. Got Crystal uh, already, uh, Kevin Street. Good guess. Yeah, got She Thing in there. That was Miss Marvel. She think Wildcat, I think we tried. Got Sandman in there. Spectre. Thanks, uh, Steve Sorensen and Drake Sather. Uh, so Justice Society is good. Uh, Teen Titans, I think I know who that is. I just thought of it. Lilith. Yeah, pretty obscure, but she was on the team. Lilith Clay. Oh, and Philip Arsenault just suggested that. Thank you. Uh, so who do we have left? Oh, do we not have She-Hulk? Did I know I never put in She-Hulk? Oh, geez. I'm sorry, folks. I never I never caught She-Hulk. Um, that means we only have what? Oh, we only have a one Legion of Superheroes person. Boy, and there's so many of them. But who was at the beginning? That's all we've got left. That's all we've got left. Pharaoh, Lad, no. Solar Boy. I think we've got Invisible Kid in there. Or I tried. Yeah, we've got Invisible Kid in there. We tried Brainiac 5. Element Lad? Element Lad. No. Supergirl, maybe? No. 30 seconds. Oh, 20 seconds. Our Man, we've got. We just need one Legion of Superheroes person, and I can't think of it. Oh, no. I wanted to be a completionist. I've got less than 10 seconds. I can't think of it. <laughs> Bowling Boy. Oh, I can't think of it. Who are we not thinking of? I'm proud that I got things like Lilith and Guardian and Teen Titans. Kid Quantum? Kid Quantum? What do, what do most people get? I got 99%. Average score, 43%. Folks, thanks to you, I think we did all right. I think we did more than all right. Weird way to end a show that started on such a prestigious note, right? We start with uh, an interview with uh, a titan of the industry, uh, Mike Allred, we end doing a ridiculous uh, quiz. Thank you very much, folks, for helping me out with the uh, quiz. I, I couldn't have gotten it all by my, like, couldn't have gotten that far. You guys helped me out with a bunch of them. That's a fun way to end it. I know next week, uh, I think I saw a piece of news that I couldn't pull all the info on, but uh, there, there's a... Um, there's a magazine in the UK that does a power 
list of comic book people each year and they they, they released one so um I'm going to try to find that and we could like discuss that. And I believe I will have an interview next week. Um, definitely will in two weeks, but I'm pretty sure we'll have an interview next week as well. Uh, so every once in a while, I'll start that off with like a 20 to 30 minute interview when we've got access to somebody. Uh, and that was, that was really fun. Everybody. I had a great night. I had a great night getting to talk to Mike Allred and then getting this amazing piece of artwork by Danny Earls. And of course, getting to talk to all of you about, you know, the comic book news and the comics like Avengers Twilight and uh, Cobra Commander number one, Wolverine 41. Just just so much fun. What a, what a night. What a night. Thank you all. If you're in Orlando, remember, you might get to see the All Reds at Disney and you should definitely check out the original art expo a place where you can get original art by all these amazing creators a friend of the show jim mafood is there um mike's there brian stelfries adam hughes um jimmy palmiotti so many people would i like a jelly baby i believe it is the birthday of fourth dr tom baker today all right everybody be seeing you take care keep reading comics double salute you earned it and remember Get yourself a big zipper if you want to be cool. Take care.